I have been researching aspects of what I am presenting in this video for years, but this subject came about as an in-depth research topic for me through Aaron of the Uncovering Hidden West Virginia video, who sent me rock formations at locations in Appalachia he had identified to look at that looked like megaliths. Megaliths were structures made of large stones by ancient cultures. In other words, they are acknowledged to have been constructed intentionally and megaliths have been identified as such all over the earth, but they are not identified as megaliths and man-made in North America. As soon as I started doing the research into the rock formations described as natural rock cities in state parks in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, four main themes clearly unfolded and were interwoven in the research for my original video on the Trail of Giants in Appalachia and beyond. I am bringing forward these four main themes separately for your consideration in this series. This is the third themed segment that is done with the featured theme of the energy grid. The last themed segment will be on my findings related to evidence for the cataclysm. The first two themed segments were on robber barons and resetters and giants. This particular video on the energy grid will be focusing on topics including but not limited to the consistent finding of a history of railroads running beside S-shaped river bends, also called horseshoe bends, and other transportation infrastructure, findings on the integral role giant trees played on the Earth's grid system, and how the infrastructure of this energy grid system has been reverse engineered into a control system. My name is Michelle Gibson. When I first started out doing the research for the original video, my plan for it was just to look at the places with megalithic looking rock formations that Aaron had identified in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Well that was my plan anyway and that was exactly how my research started out and I kept seeing the same story repeating over and over again. The first place I checked out was Boxcar Rocks on Gold Mine Road in Pennsylvania's Lebanon County. We are told that they are a natural geologic formation described as a long line of stacked boulders that were likely left over from melting glacial deposits during the last ice age. Yet here are images that Aaron sent me where the stone blocks of boxcar rocks look like they have been cut and shaped. Boxcar rocks are located on Pennsylvania State Game Lands number 211 who manage the lands for the purposes of hunting, trapping, and fishing. The Appalachian Trail runs through the Pennsylvania State Game Lands number 211 in Swatara State Park where we still find sections of the Old Union Canal on the Bear Hole Trail of Swatara State Park. This section of the Union Canal was said to have been closed after the dam holding the reservoir was washed away by a devastating flood in 1862. The Union Canal was said to have been built between 1792 and 1828, running from Middletown, Pennsylvania to Reading, Pennsylvania. We are told it was closed to use in 1885 because it could not compete with the efficiency of the railroad. We are told in our historical narrative that the construction of the Union Canal started under the administration of President George Washington in 1792 and was touted as the golden link in providing an early transportation route for shipping anthracite coal and lumber to Philadelphia. So early on in the narrative there was a stated focus on the harvesting of resources such as coal and lumber which is one of the many recurring themes in this video. The very next place I looked at was the World's End State Park in the Loyal Sox State Forest. World's End State Park is in what is called the Endless Mountains, a region of northeastern Pennsylvania that are not considered true mountains, but a dissected plateau on the Allegheny Plateau. We are told the Endless Mountains are comprised of sedimentary rocks of sandstone and shale that were part of a lowland that collected sediments from mountains to the southeast that eroded millions upon millions of years ago. This region was historically inhabited by the Susquehannock, Iroquois, and Muncie Lenape peoples. Here are some photos from the World's End State Park with what appears to be shaped and cut block shaped stonework. Before I move on to the other places I looked at for On the Trail of Giants in Appalachia and beyond, I would like to mention that I was already dialed in to the co location of S shaped riverbends, railroads, canals, hydroelectric plants, gorges, and waterfalls as all being part of the Earth's original energy grid system. I did extensive research on these findings as seen in a video I published on June 6, 2023 titled Of Railroads and Waterfalls and Other Physical Infrastructure of the Earth's Grid System. 
In this video, I looked closely at this same infrastructure found past and present along the Potomac River in Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia, along the Niagara River between New York and Ontario, the Tallulah River in North Georgia, the Taquaman River in Upper Michigan, and the Sacramento River in Northern California. I also looked in depth into this subject several years ago when viewer JG connected with me about correlations she had found between railroads and waterfalls in Iowa. She sent me Google Maps showing the locations of railroads and state parks with waterfalls and racetracks, as well as another set of maps with more key things like the locations of power plants, mines, and sports stadiums. I focused this particular research on the correlations between railroads and waterfalls in Iowa that JG sent me as a grouping. The places JG sent me turned out to be in the part of Iowa where Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois meet in a region called the Driftless Area. This part of North America is called the Driftless Area because it was said to have been bypassed by the last glacier on the continent, and we are told lacks glacial drift. I also looked in depth at the rail, river, waterfall, and hydroelectric power plants along the New River and New River Gorge for research that I did for trekking the Serpent Lay, a major southeast to northwest ley line identified by Peter Shampu. I will be bringing up the New River Gorge in several capacities in this video, and the Serpent Lay went right through this region that I will be talking about throughout this video. In trekking the Serpent Lay, I started in the Bermuda Triangle and ended at Lake Itasca in Minnesota the headwaters of the Mississippi River. So to return once again to the second place I looked at when I started to do this research for On the Trail of Giants, the World's End State Park near Forksville and the Loyal Sauk State Forest, and is situated around the S-shaped bends of Loyal Sauk Creek with Pennsylvania State Route 154 running right beside it. Pennsylvania State Route 154 meets Pennsylvania State Route 87 in Forksville. I looked for a railroad history through here along Loyal Sauk Creek. Many more examples of what I'm talking about with regards to past railroads and present day highway routes to come. There's not much available to find concerning this on the internet. However, I was able to find this specifically concerning a railroad history on Loyal Sauk Creek. A steam locomotive missing its smokestack was pulled from Loyal Sauk Creek in 1906 east of the Route 87 bridge in Hillsgrove, Pennsylvania, near Forksville. Then, in 2013, a local scuba diver familiar with the history found the missing smokestack. But in the process of trying to pinpoint information about a railroad history on Loyal Sauk Creek, I stumbled upon the Lehigh Gorge, its abandoned railroad tracks that are now a recreational rail trail, and its scenic railway, and another place I could add to my list of places I know off the top of my head, featuring the co-location of S-shaped riverbends, railroads, canals, gorges, and waterfalls. The Lehigh Gorge is described as a steep-walled gorge carved by a river, thick vegetation, rock outcroppings, and waterfalls characterize the state park. The Lehigh Gorge Trail follows more than 20 miles or 32 kilometers of the Delaware and Lehigh Trail, part of the larger Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor, which is 165 miles or 266 kilometers long. The Lehigh Gorge Trail is on an abandoned railroad grade beside the river. This is what we are told about the Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor by the National Park Service. The Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor preserves the historic pathway that carried coal and iron from Wilkes-Barre to Philadelphia as a vital connection to nature, recreation, and our nation's industrial heritage, as well as having a more than $250 million per year economic impact for the region. The Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor was also known as the Anthracite Region, where the story of where America was built began. What we are told about the anthracite region is this. It was home at one time to major anthracite coal supplies and the mine to market process with the legacy of intense mining, industrial development, and a rich mixture of ethnic cultures. Anthracite coal was first mined in Wilkes-Barre in 1775, and we are told that it fueled urban development in the region, resulting in a string of towns, industries, mines, roads, and rail lines to the south. 
It is interesting to note here that the Freiburg University of Mining and Technology, the oldest school of mining and metallurgy in the world, was established just 10 years prior to the beginning of anthracite coal mining in Wilkes-Barre, having been established in 1765 by Francis Xavier of Saxony of the House of Wetten. Its main purpose was the education of highly skilled miners and scientists in fields connected to mining and metallurgy. Primarily through Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, first cousins and members of the House of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha, of the Ernestine branch of the House of Wetten, the original royal houses of Europe were completely replaced by this obscure German ducal lineage. We are told that the demand for anthracite coal increased in the 1820s and 1830s as coal power replaced water power and with the growth of the iron industry in Pennsylvania. Anthracite coal is the purest form of coal and this region contains most of the world's supply of anthracite coal and found in alternating layers of rock said to have been folded into mountains and created by a geological process called coalification. Today, this part of northeastern Pennsylvania is considered one of the largest concentrations of disturbed terrain in the world, with billions of tons of debris found in the landscape of abandoned strip mines, and this region has among the highest poverty and unemployment rates in the United States, with job loss from the decrease in coal mining and the outmigration of people because of it. We are told the American Canal Age was between 1790 and 1855 and started in Pennsylvania where the first legislation surveying canals was passed in 1762. As mentioned previously, the construction of the Union Canal between Middletown and Reading was said to have started under the administration of President George Washington in 1792 and completed in 1828 and was touted as the golden link in providing an early transportation route for shipping anthracite coal and lumber to Philadelphia. The main line of public works of which the Union Canal was a part of was passed by the Pennsylvania Legislature in 1826 and funded various transportation systems including canal, road, and railroad. We are told the lower section of the Lehigh Canal was built between Easton, Pennsylvania and Mock Chunk, now known as Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, with construction said to have been started in 1818 and completed in 1838. This map also has a caption at the bottom that says this was the original Lehigh Valley Railroad line as well, which was said to have opened in 1855. This is a view of the Lehigh Canal as it appeared at one time in our history in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, located along this section in between today's Jim Thorpe and Easton. The National Canal Museum in Easton is dedicated to telling the story of America's historic towpath canals. In Easton, the Lehigh Canal connected with the Pennsylvania Canal's Delaware Division and the Morris Canal. Also known as the Delaware Canal, the Pennsylvania Canal was said to have built the Delaware Canal in the years between 1828 and 1834 to feed anthracite coal to Philadelphia. The Morris Canal was 107 miles or 172 kilometers long and said to have been completed in 1832 to carry anthracite coal across northern New Jersey between where it connected to the Delaware Canal in Easton to where today is Jersey City on the Hudson River. It was closed in 1924. It was hailed as an ingenious technological marvel for its use of water-driven inclined planes. The builders of the Morris Canal used a sophisticated powerhouse technology, pictured here, to power the water turbine that was set in motion to raise or lower cradled beds on the inclined planes by means of a cable. You mean to tell me all of this extremely sophisticated and advanced canal engineering technology was being implemented prior to the beginning of the industrial age, according to the history we've been taught? Seriously? And on top of that, mules were still needed to be used to pull the canal boats in places on the Morris Canal in spite of all that sophisticated technology? food for thought about the difference between what we are told and what does not hold up under scrutiny. I would like to insert my belief at this point that there was a deliberately caused cataclysm that sent directed energy through the free energy generating earth grids that devastated the surface of the earth and destroyed the original ancient advanced Moorish civilization that built all of this infrastructure. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I will be talking about this cataclysm and its aftermath in depth in the fourth and final themed segment of this series. 
In short, I believe the beings behind the cataclysm were shovel-ready to dig enough of the original infrastructure out of the ruined earth so they could be used and civilization restarted, which I think started in earnest in the mid to late 1700s and early 1800s. They only used the pre-existing infrastructure until they found replacement fuel sources that could be monetized and controlled by them, and when what remained of the original infrastructure was no longer useful to them or inconvenient to their agenda, they had it destroyed, discontinued, or abandoned, typically in a very short time after it was said to have been constructed. So the first original infrastructure we see coming online in the post-cataclysmic new world were the canals. In the old world, the power supply for the canals would have been the same free energy generated by the Earth's worldwide grid system, and in the new world, they had to use mule power to be able to utilize the original canal system because that was all they had for power at that time. Now back to the Lehigh Gorge State Park. The over 6,000 acres of land followed the Lehigh River from the Francis E. Walter Dam to the north to Jim Thorpe at the southern end of the park. We are told that the Francis C. E. Walter Dam was constructed as an embankment dam by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in 1961 for flood control at the confluence of the Lehigh River and Bear Creek. A reservoir ended up being created, which in turn became a popular recreational destination. What remains of the original Lehigh Valley Railroad operations are run today as the Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railway. The excursion through the Lehigh Gorge begins in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania formerly known as Mock Chunk, at the southern end of the state park. Mock Chunk was nicknamed the Switzerland of America for its steep hillsides, narrow streets, and terraced gardens. Renamed Jim Thorpe in 1954 for the Native American sports legend who was buried here, it was founded as a company town in 1818 by Josiah White and his partners, who were also founders of the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company. The Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company was a mining and transportation company that was headquartered in Mock Chunk. It operated from 1818 until it was dissolved in 1964 and was known for having an early and influential role in the American Industrial Revolution. The Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company was considered to be the first vertically integrated company in the United States. Vertical integration is where the supply chain of a company is owned by the company. Other examples of the adoption of the business practice of vertical integration off the top of my head was by Adolphus Bush as the head of the Anheuser-Busch Brewing Association. Bush adopted vertical integration as a business practice in which he bought all the components of his business, from bottling factories to ice manufacturing plants, to buying the rights from Rudolph Diesel to manufacture all diesel engines in America. This illustration was of the Bevo bottling facility in St. Louis. I couldn't find any information showing that Adolphus Bush was a Freemason, but I did find this mug that was made in 1994 by Anheuser Bush for the Freemasons of Rio Negrinho in Brazil, featuring a life-size goat head and the Brazilian words for liberty, equality, and fraternity in the base. Henry Ford also utilized the practice of vertical integration in the Ford Motor Company. The introduction and refinement of the assembly line facilitated the mass production of new cars, which in turn made the purchase of a new car affordable for most people. As we go through all the information that will be presented in this video, we will see why this was yet another replacement technology for the original transportation system, which was powered by free energy. Henry Ford was also the 13th wealthiest American of all time, according to CNN Business, with an adjusted wealth of $67.2 billion. Henry Ford was also an acknowledged 33rd degree Freemason and famous for saying, history is bunk. Though fact checkers are denying that he could have meant the definition of bunk, meaning trash, junk, or lies. Back to the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company and Mock Chunk. It had its beginnings as the Lehigh Coal Mine Company in 1792 after we are told a hunter named Philip Ginter discovered anthracite coal on Pisgah Mountain near Summit Hill near the border between Luzerne and Carbon Counties. This part of the Appalachian Mountains in northeastern Pennsylvania is a subregion called the Pocono Mountains. 
though they are described very similarly to the nearby endless mountains of northeastern Pennsylvania as a dissected plateau of the Allegheny Plateau. Geographically, the Poconos are designated separately from the Endless Mountains. Pocono is said to mean crack between two hills in the language of the original Muncie Lenape people of this region. I'm taking time on this subject right now because this will be a recurring subject throughout this video, but I want to show you a comparison of the ridge-like appearance of this region around Jim Thorpe and Summit Hill, near where the anthracite coal was found here on Pisgah Mountain in 1792 on the top left, with the ridge-like appearance of the root system of a large tree on the bottom right. The Lehigh Coal Mine Company was incorporated in 1793 and acquired 10,000 acres or 4,000 hectares in and around the Panther Creek Valley and Pisgah Mountain in order to bring anthracite coal from the large deposits on Pisgah Mountain to Philadelphia via mule trains and coal arcs or one-time single-use boats on the Lehigh and Delaware rivers. We are told that while the original Lehigh Coal Mine Company was able to sell all the coal it could to the available market, it lost a lot of coal to the rough waters of the unimproved Lehigh River. So they sold the original company to Josiah White and his partners in 1818. In a nutshell, this is what we are told. In the same year, in 1818, the new owners of the Lehigh Coal Mine Company began the construction of the Lehigh Canal and that it became usable in 1820. The Lehigh Canal enabled the transport of anthracite coal, a primary energy source at the time, to the primary markets in the northeastern United States and, we are told, inspired the development and connection of other regional canals. The new owners of the Lehigh Coal Mine Company were said to have been behind the construction of the Lehigh and Susquehanna Railroad between 1839 and 1841. The Ashley Plains, an historic freight cable railroad between Ashley and Mountaintop, said to have been built between 1837 and 1838 to transport millions of tons of anthracite coal over the Wilkes-Barre Mountain, and brought in blast furnace technology to the Lehigh Valley, a type of metallurgical furnace used for smelting to produce industrial metals. Smelting is defined as a process by which metal is obtained, either as a single element or compound. In 1822, the company became the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company, after which they built the Mock Chunk and Summit Hill Railroad. The Mock Chunk and Summit Hill Railroad, also known as the Mock Chunk Switchback Railway, was said to have been built in 1827 and operated until 1932. It was said to be the second permanent railway constructed in the United States and used to transport coal down Summit Hill to the Lehigh Canal. Some of the architecture of today's Jim Thorpe include the Asa Packer Mansion, which was said to have been completed in 1861, which would have been the first year of the American Civil War. Asa Packer was, among other things, a coal and railroad magnate, philanthropist, and founder of Lehigh University in nearby Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which was founded in 1865, the last year of the American Civil War. At the time of his death, the value of Asa Packer's estate was $54.5 million, and he was considered to be the richest man in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania at that time. And Asa Packer was a Freemason, too. Another place I want to show you in Jim Thorpe was the old jail, in which seasonal tours are offered, including the ghostly kind, as it is considered one of the most haunted places in Pennsylvania. It was said to have been built between 1869 and 1870 and in use as a jail until 1995. Mock Chunk slash Jim Thorpe was a key location on the Central Railroad of New Jersey in the shipping of anthracite coal. The Central Railroad of New Jersey was said to have built the Mock Chunk Station in 1888 in the Queen Anne Victorian architectural style. Today it is owned and operated by the Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railroad. This is what we are told about the Central Railroad of New Jersey. The origins of the Central Railroad of New Jersey began in 1831 with the incorporation of the Elizabeth and Somerville Railroad, which was operational by 1842. In 1847, the Somerville and Easton Railroad was incorporated and purchased the Elizabeth and Somerville, and the name was changed to the Central Railroad Company of New Jersey. By 1852, the line reached Phillipsburg in New Jersey on the Delaware River and was extended across Newark Bay to Jersey City in 1864, 
one year before the end of the American Civil War in 1865. From Jersey City, the railroad kept extending out to major cities like Newark, Flemington, Perth Amboy, Chester, and Wharton. We are told that the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company built the C&J's lines in Pennsylvania, which was used primarily for the shipment of anthracite coal. The Central Railroad of New Jersey Terminal in Jersey City was said to have been built in 1889 to replace an earlier one and is located next to the big basin of the Morris Canal on the Hudson Waterfront in today's Liberty State Park, as it is in close proximity to Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty in Upper New York Bay. It was operational as a terminal until April 30th of 1967. An estimated 10.5 million immigrants processed through here at one time in America's history, when Ellis Island was operational as an immigrant processing station between 1892 and 1954. The architectural style of the Central Railroad of New Jersey Terminal Building is called Richardsonian Romanesque after architect Henry Hobson Richardson, who first used elements of this style in the Buffalo State Asylum for the Insane in Buffalo, New York, which Richardson was said to have designed in 1870 and Frederick Law Olmsted was the landscape architect, we are told, and the Kirkbride plan treatment for people with mental illness was implemented here. More on the Kirkbride plan to come later in this video. The Buffalo State Asylum for the Insane was closed for that purpose in the 1970s. The former Insane Asylum was repurposed as a hotel, which opened in 2023, and is considered one of the most haunted places in Buffalo, if not western New York State. Richardsonian Romanesque was described as a free revival style incorporating 11th and 12th century Southern French, Spanish, and Italian Romanesque characteristics. Henry Hobson Richardson had a relatively short career and didn't even complete his architecture school training in Paris because he lost family backing because of the American Civil War. Yet somehow, by the time he died at the relatively young age of 47, he left behind a legacy of mind-blowingly ornate architecture. Hmm, you don't say. One more thing about the Central Railroad of New Jersey here. All of the new railroad lines, we are told, that were popping up betwixt and between these large population centers and the Jersey Shore, like Atlantic City, were going right through the desolate, swampy, and forbidding Pine Barrens. Today, there are abandoned trains and railroad lines found throughout the New Jersey Pine Barrens. I will expand on this finding in the next and final part of this series on the Cataclysm. I originally explored this region in depth over a year ago in my video called Recovering Lost History from the Estuaries, Pine Barrens, and Elite Enclaves off the Atlantic Northeast Coast of the United States. Before I move on from the Poconos, I would like to take a look at Mount Pocono. This is what we are told about the history of the Mount Pocono Borough. Early records showed a settlement at today's Tobihanna, where the Tobihanna and Lehigh Lumber Company operated not only a lumber mill, but a clothespin factory and silk mill. Tobihanna Mills was situated along the Easton and Belmont Turnpike, a turnpike that was said to have been chartered in 1812, the beginning of the War of 1812, and completed in 1820. Turnpikes are still with us today in which a fee or toll is assessed for passage. Today, the former Belton to Easton Turnpike is Pennsylvania State Route 196 in the Poconos that runs for 26 miles or 41 kilometers north from Mount Pocono to where it meets up with State Route 296 in Varden. Besides Pennsylvania Route 196, two other state highways serve Mount Pocono. One is Route 611 and the other is Route 940. And there are six interstate highways serving the region of the Pocono Mountains. They are interstates I-80, I-81, I-84, I-78, I-380, and I-476. More on this subject to come. The Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad Main Line passed through the southern end of the Mount Pocono Borough, which provided access to the borough from New York City via the terminal at Hoboken, New Jersey. One of the New York area's major transportation hubs the terminal at Hoboken was said to have been constructed by the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad in 1907 and combined railroad, ferry, subway, streetcar, and pedestrian services. We are told that numerous electric streetcar lines originated and ended at the station until the completion of 
Bustitution in August of 1949, at which time they were replaced by buses. This included the Hoboken Inclined Railway, which consisted of several lines, including the Palisade Line, that traveled from Edgewater to Palisade's Amusement Park, which operated from 1898 to 1971, and the El Dorado Elevator, which met a streetcar line that traveled along a trestle to a cut in the Palisades, which ran parallel to the El Dorado, an amusement park that opened in 1891 and closed as an amusement park in 1894, except for the Hotel Casino. The El Dorado's main building was used to host boxing matches and vaudeville performances until it burned down in a massive fire in 1898. There is still a Hoboken terminal in use today as an intermodal transportation hub. We are told that a Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad station was built at the crossing of what is now Pennsylvania State Route 611 in 1886, but that most of that station was demolished in 1937 when the highway was widened and passenger service to the station ended completely in 1956. The rails are still in place and used by freight trains and occasional excursions from the Steamtown National Historic Site. The location might possibly come back to life as a proposed New Jersey Transit Rail Operations Station. From 1912, Toby Hanna was said to have a railroad station on the Delaware, Lackawanna and Western Railroad line, as well as a post office and telegraph station, and other local industries included shipping ice to different locations, including Florida. Also starting in 1912, the ground was laid for the U.S. government to purchase thousands of acres of land for a military installation, which started out as an artillery training range with all their horse-drawn wagons, right in time for the beginning of World War I, which started in July of 1914. The Toby Hanna Army Depot these days is a full-service electronics maintenance facility for the United States Department of Defense. I want to leave one more bit of information here about the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad line as another placeholder for expansion upon in the next video on the Cataclysm. I have come to believe this whole region in the northeastern United States was ground zero for at least one deliberately caused cataclysm that brought us to the world we live in today. The Cayuga and Susquehanna Railroad ran in New York from Owego on the Susquehanna River to Ithaca on the southern shore of Lake Cayuga, one of the Finger Lakes. It was said to have been chartered in 1828 and the third railroad and longest at the time built in the United States. We are told at the time it was planned, it was to provide the missing link connecting the Erie Canal and the Great Lakes to the coal fields of Pennsylvania and the Chesapeake Bay, but it never lived up to this potential for a variety of reasons. The right-of-way was completely abandoned in 1956 and it later became part of the South Hill Recreation Way in Ithaca. I will continue to bring forward examples of findings like this as I work my way through different locations in this video, but it's not hard to visualize the Finger Lakes and this whole region for that matter as once having been giant tree roots. There's a few other things I would like to mention about the Pocono Mountains before I move on from here. What we were told is that the Pocono Mountains became a well-known resort getaway early in the 20th century. So, for example, this was an early postcard showing the Pocono Mountain House and Springs. It was one of the largest resorts that served visitors to the Pocono Mountains and was located on Route 611 in the Mount Pocono Borough. It was said to have started as a sportsman's club in 1874 and grew into a popular resort. Besides recreational activities of all kinds, there were springs here that were known for healing properties. The resort closed permanently to the public in 1933 and we are told that by 1974 it had fallen into such disrepair that the local fire department had to burn it down. But not all those resorts in what became known as the honeymoon capital of the world in the Pocono Mountains burned down. The Poconos are littered with abandoned resorts that were left to rot in place. Today's Mount Airy Casino Resort in Mount Pocono operates as Pennsylvania's first AAA Diamond Casino Resort. We'll see another Mount Airy later in this video. It was said to have been built on the site of the Mount Airy Lodge, which our narrative tells us was originally built in 1898 and then reconstructed in the 1950s and became known as America's premier honeymoon hideaway and for its top entertainment. The 1950s building was said to have been demolished in 2001 and the current resort opened in 2007. 
Another place I would like to bring to your attention here before I move on is the Pocono Raceway in Long Ponds, Pennsylvania. The Pocono Raceway is a super speedway nicknamed the Tricky Triangle. It is one of six super speedways in the United States, along with Indianapolis, Daytona, Talladega, Michigan, and the Auto Club Speedway in California. I first uploaded the Circuit Board Earth video in June of 2021, which was a compilation of my research findings up to that time of consistently finding infrastructure on the Earth in specific linear arrangements in relationship to each other all over the surface of the Earth, and providing the model of Earth as a circuit board as an explanation for these findings that they were components of the once free energy generating electromagnetic grid system. I covered a lot of information and examples in the circuit board Earth video to support this concept, but what I want to bring forward here is the example of the same finding in the Pocono Mountains, that of airports having racing tracks in angular relationships short distances away. I first noticed this when I was doing research on the Shepherd's Bush District of West London several years ago based on a commenter's suggestion. In the process of doing that, I realized I had seen the same angular relationship between London's Heathrow Airport and Shepherd's Bush on the top left, where there had been a huge track at one time in White City that had been used for greyhound racing, and in my own research of the Tampa, Florida neighborhood of Sulphur Springs the previous summer when I had noticed that the Tampa International Airport and the Sulphur Springs neighborhood in Tampa, Florida, where there was a Greyhound racing track, had the same angular relationship. After I made that initial connection, commenters left other examples of the same kind of relationship between airports and racing tracks, past and present, including, but not limited to, places like Montreal, Quebec on the top right, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on the middle left, Toronto, Ontario, in the middle, Los Angeles, California on the middle right, and Sydney, Australia on the bottom. I think the various shapes being used as racing tracks were once components of the circuitry of the Earth's electromagnetic grid system. The sport of racing uses the word circuit in the following ways. The course over which races are won, the number of times the racers go around the track, an established itinerary of racing events involving public performance, and in bicycle racing, a circuit race is a mass start road cycle race that consists of several laps of a closed circuit where the length of the lap is slightly longer each time. Electrical circuit definitions include a closed path in which electrons from a voltage or current source flow and includes devices that give energy to the charged particles the current is comprised of, such as batteries and generators. And an electronic circuit is a complete course of conductors through which current can travel and provide a path for current to flow. Wouldn't it stand to reason that those behind the reset when setting up the new world would take advantage of the super science of the different types of circuits in the Earth's grid system in order to harness their inherent power to enhance performance at sporting events, to make lots of money at highly charged prestigious gaming and betting venues? more explorations of this topic to come later in this video. Now I'm going to move on from the Poconos, but this is the information that came up to the surface just in looking at boxcar rocks and the what appears to be shaped and cut block-shaped stonework at World's End State Park on the S-shaped Loyal Sock Creek. Next I'm going to turn my attention to what is found in the Moshannon State Forest. The Moshannon State Forest is in five counties, Center, Elk, Cameron, Clinton, and Clearfield, with its main offices in Penfield in Clearfield County's Houston Township at the intersection of State Routes 153 and 255. In the 2020 census, the population of Houston Township as a whole was recorded as a little under 1,300 people. At one time in Penfield's history, it was a company town for the logging and coal mining industries in what was a local resource extraction economy and the railroad came through here at one time. Immigrants from Europe settled in the area to work the deep mines scattered throughout the Benzet Valley here. There's not much left to speak of in Penfield, but there are recreational activities nearby at Moshannon State Forest, Bilger's Rocks Park, Parker Dam State Park, and Black Moshannon State Park. Moshannon State Forest was formed as a direct result of the depletion of the forest of Pennsylvania that happened in the mid to late 19th century when lumber and iron companies clear-cut the forests 
and sparks from passing steam locomotives caused wildfires from the remnants of the forest lands, preventing the growth of new forests. The land that became Moshannon State Forest was purchased by the state in 1898. The old growth forest was gone by 1921, with a second growth forest replacing it since then. Interesting to note that a tornado in 1985 tore through the forest and destroyed an estimated 88,000 trees. Panther rocks at Moshannon State Forest are described as a small rock city made of several large sandstone blocks, complete with streets, overhangs, channels, crevices, and a short tunnel. They were said to have formed during the Pennsylvania age of the Carboniferous period of the Paleozoic era more than 300 million years ago and were rocks formed by sediments deposited in streams and rivers. The nearby Builders Rocks is in Clearfield County's Bloom Township near the town of Grampian and is a larger stone city than what is found at Panther Rocks. The creation of Builders Rocks was also said to have taken place during the same time period as Panther Rocks and also formed by sediments deposited in streams and rivers. Bilger's Rocks has many examples of what appears to be tool marks and linear patterns that look like they were carved or molded, and has the same rock city-like qualities of these other places we have been looking at, tucked away in the Pennsylvania Park System. Parker Dam State Park is surrounded by the Moshannon State Forest. The park was said to have been constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Great Depression. The original dam here was said to have been constructed as a splash dam for the movement of lumber after lumbering rights were leased at some point after lumber harvesting began here in 1794, and the CCC was said to have built the current dam there to replace it as part of the improvements the otherwise unemployed, unskilled young men made when they came to work on the park. There was much logging going on in this region, so the Susquehanna boom was said to have been built in the 1850s across the West Susquehanna River at Williamsport, a system of cribs and chained logs designed to catch and hold floating timber until it could be processed, and logging railroads built to transport the lumber to the tune of 45 cars per day until logging ended here in 1911, when all the trees were gone. The lumbermen left a barren landscape that was devastated by fires, flooding, and erosion for many more years, until the CCC came in the 1930s and started replanting trees after the state of Pennsylvania bought the deforested land from the Central Pennsylvania Lumber Company in 1930. The Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, operated from 1933 to 1942 in the United States for unemployed, unmarried men to do manual labor related to the conservation and development of natural resources in rural lands owned by federal, state, and local governments. Originally for young men ages 18 to 25, it was eventually expanded to ages 17 to 28. In the nine years of its operation, the CCC employed 3 million young men, providing them with food, shelter, and clothing, and a wage of $30 per month, $25 of which had to be sent home to their families. There's no doubt in my mind that the CCC and the other alphabet programs of FDR's New Deal during the Great Depression, like the WPA and TVA, were being used to cover up the ancient advanced civilization. Black Moshannon State Park is largely surrounded by the Moshannon State Forest. It is located in Rush Township in Center County and surrounds a lake formed by another dam, also said to have been constructed by the CCC, on Black Moshannon Creek at the site of a former Mill Pond Dam. Black Moshannon State Park is the home to the largest reconstituted bog in Pennsylvania, a wetland that accumulates peat as a deposit of dead plant materials, which contains carnivorous plants, orchids, and species typically found further north. The boggy Black Moshannon State Park in Pennsylvania has a similar story as Cranberry Glades in West Virginia. Cranberry Glades, protected in the Cranberry Glades Botanical Area, are a cluster of five separate boreal-type bogs in southwestern Pocahontas County in West Virginia. And like Black Moshannon State Park, species are found at both of these locations that are typically further north. These species include cranberries, sphagnum moss, skunk cabbage, and carnivorous plants, and the cranberry glades are the southernmost home of many of the plant species found here. Both Black Moshannon State Park in Pennsylvania and Cranberry Glades Botanical Area in West Virginia have S-shaped river bends and airports nearby, with the name of the parks notated by an oval, the airports by a box, 
and the river bends are pointed at by arrows. The snowshoe rails to trails is near Black Moshannon, as seen here in the top left-hand corner, right next to the Moshannon Creek, where the arrows are pointing. The snowshoe rails to trails has 19 miles or 31 kilometers of abandoned railroad bed along 37 miles or 60 kilometers of legalized snowshoe township roads for ATVs and UTVs. We are told that it was originally the route of the Beach Creek Railroad between the South Jersey Shore and Mahaffey Borough, Pennsylvania, and part of the Susquehanna and Southwestern Railroad, and used for coal mining services in the region starting in 1884. Mahaffey Borough, first incorporated in 1841, was located on U.S. Route 219 at the junction of the New York Central Railroad and the Hudson River Railroad. The arrows point to where railroad tracks ran along S-shaped river bends on this section of Route 219 going through Mahaffey Borough. This railroad project in Pennsylvania was said to have been backed and financed by William H. Vanderbilt, president of the New York Central Railroad. The New York Central Railroad was said to have begun operating in 1853 with the consolidation of earlier independent companies running between Albany and Buffalo. This graphic depicts the New York Central Rail System as of 1918. We are told extensive trackage existed in the states of New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Massachusetts, and West Virginia, plus additional trackage in Ontario and Quebec and by 1925 operated 26,395 miles, or 42,479 kilometers of track. William Vanderbilt had developed a plan to facilitate railroad access to enter the Clearfield Coal Field, a large juicy coal mining area in Clearfield County, which would have otherwise been exclusively accessed by the Pennsylvania Railroad. It was said to have been constructed starting at the end of 1882 to high standards including extensive curvature, bridges, and a tunnel, and became operational in November of 1884. In West Virginia, Cranberry Glades is located close to both the New River Gorge National Park and Preserve and White Sulphur Springs. First, New River Gorge National Park and Preserve. The New River Gorge is one of the places that I know of that still has a railroad operating right along beside the S-shaped New River. The Amtrak Cardinal still runs through the New River Gorge three days per week, on Sundays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Besides the railroad line that runs along the New River through the New River Gorge in West Virginia, there are things found in the gorge like historic coal mines, waterfalls, and hydro projects. We are told that after the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway opened up this rugged wilderness in 1873, coal was carried out of the New River Gorge to ports in Virginia and to cities in the Midwest. As a result, by 1905, 13 cities sprang up between Fayette and Thurmond, which was 15 miles or 24 kilometers upstream, and provided the West Virginia coal that contributed greatly to the industrialization of the United States until the 1950s. After the coal seams were exhausted and mines closed, these company towns like Fayette were for the most part completely abandoned, with the possible exception of Thurmond, which had a very small population of five in 2010. Aaron sent me information about the Red Ash and Rush Run Coke Ovens near Thurmond. The Rush Run Coke Ovens were said to belong to the Rush Run Mining Company, and there were believed to have been up to 180 of them at this location, which borders the railroad tracks. Coke Ovens are described as being made of brick, or some kind of heat-resistant material, and used to separate the coal gas, coal water, and tar. Coke is formed when the coal gas and coal water fuse together, and is used primarily in steel production. The nearby Red Ash Coal Camp was developed by the Red Ash Coal and Coke Company in 1891 for a high quality coal that burned with a fine red ash. There were estimated to be 80 coke ovens here at one time and the mine was exhausted by the 1950s. There's a service tunnel at the location of the Red Ash Coke Ovens. The fine brickwork found at the Red Ash facilities reminds me of the fine brickwork I have seen in tunnels all over the place, including what is called the Great Tunnel of the CNO Canal in Allegheny County, Maryland, and part of the Paw Paw Bend section of the Potomac River as it is winding its way through West Virginia and Maryland. Built using more than six million bricks, this tunnel has been described as the greatest engineering marvel along the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal National Historical Park. 
It is located roughly midway between Black Moshannon State Park in Pennsylvania and Cranberry Glades in West Virginia. The Paw Paw Tunnel was said to have been built between 1836 and 1850 for the CNO Canal to bypass the bends in the Potomac River near Paw Paw, West Virginia. The CNO Canal closed to canal boats in 1924. We are told that the CNO Canal and other canals were made obsolete because the railroad was so much more efficient and canals couldn't compete with them, such as the Wabash and Erie Canal, which was said to have been built during roughly the same time period as the CNO Canal. Canals like the CNO Canal subsequently became popular hiking, biking, and canoeing venues, as we are seeing with the rails that quietly became trails when no one was paying attention. It is interesting to note that at one time in its history, Thurmond was a prosperous railroad town that was the largest revenue generating stop on the CNO Railroad, where passenger and coal trains rolled through here throughout the day. Today, a visitor center for the National Park Service operates here in the old railroad depot. CSX Transportation, formerly the CNO Railroad, has freight transportation operations in and through historic Thurmond, and the Amtrak Cardinal passenger route goes through here the second least used Amtrak station in the nation. The Chesapeake and Ohio Railway was formed in 1869 from several smaller Virginia railroads under the guidance of Collis P. Huntington in order to connect the coal reserves of West Virginia with the new coal piers that were built in Hampton Roads and Newport News, Virginia, and first opened in 1873, forging a rail link to places like Chicago in the Midwest. Collis P. Huntington was one of the big four of Western railroading, along with Leland Stanford, Mark Hopkins, and Charles Crocker. In 1888, Huntington lost control of the railroad to J.P. Morgan, an American financier and investment banker who dominated corporate finance on Wall Street during the Gilded Age between 1877 and 1900, and William K. Vanderbilt, who managed the Vanderbilt family's railroad investments. William K. Vanderbilt was the grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, one of the richest Americans in history, who was an American magnate and who built his family's fortune in shipping and railroads. The process continued on for the CNO Railroad to consolidate and merge railroads and, for example, to gain access to productive coal fields throughout the region through the 1920s. There are waterfalls and hydroelectric projects found on the New River as it winds its way through the gorge. I was able to find several waterfalls here that are accessible by road and reference to over 100 others. The first two waterfalls I found that are accessible by road are the Kanawha Falls and Cathedral Falls. They are directly across from each other on a river bend, and they both have hydro projects next to them. Starting at the North Bend State Park in Cairo, West Virginia, northwest of Cranberry Glades and northeast of the New River Gorge, there is a 72-mile or 116-kilometer long hiking corridor known as the North Bend Rail Trail running between Cairo and Ellenboro, West Virginia. What is now the North Bend Rail Trail was at one time one of the most distinguished railroad lines in the United States. It was said to have been constructed between Grafton, West Virginia and Parkersburg, West Virginia by the Northwestern Virginia Railroad between 1851 and 1857 at which time it was sold to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and became known as the B&O Parkersburg Branch. The Parkersburg Branch was said to have been built to high engineering standards with 23 tunnels and 52 bridges to minimize curvature and had a maximum grade of 1.5 percent. During its prime it hosted the B&O Railroad's premier passenger train, the National Limited, between New York City and St. Louis, Missouri. In 1827, the state of Maryland chartered the Baltimore and Ohio, or b &O, Railroad, the first common carrier and the oldest railroad in the United States. The first section of the b &O Railroad was said to have opened in 1830, and it was said to have reached the Ohio River in 1852, the first eastern seaboard railroad to do so. Unfortunately, we are told that with the rise of automobile ownership, ridership declined, and b and ended its passenger service in 1971, at which time Amtrak took over and passenger service continued for another 10 years. Eventually, the rail line that was part of the North Bend Rail Trail became freight only, and the line was abandoned and dismantled in 1988. The trail was completed between 1991 and 1996 and also has beautiful red brick tunnels along the way. 
Now I'm going to take a look at White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, which is roughly 24 miles or 39 kilometers to the southeast of the bogs at Cranberry Glades. White Sulphur Springs was said to have been settled in 1750 and developed as a health spa in the 1770s, as the story goes after a woman was healed of rheumatism after bathing in the springs and calls itself America's Resort since 1778. The springs are on the grounds of the Greenbrier Hotel, which was said to have been built by the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad Company in 1913. So far, we have seen springs here, as well as at the former Pocono Mountain House and Springs in this video, where the fire department had to burn down the resort because it was in such bad condition after years of abandonment. Even today, the same Amtrak Cardinal line that runs through the New River Gorge has a station at White Sulphur Springs. The Greenbrier Resort was at one time a presidential getaway, with President Eisenhower the last president in office to have stayed there. The President's Cottage is a museum today. It remains a favorite retreat location for members of the United States Congress. As a matter of fact, there was a top-secret, supersized underground bunker said to have been constructed there in the 1950s during the Eisenhower administration to serve as a relocation point for the U.S. Congress in the event of a nuclear war, but when the secret came out in a 1992 newspaper article, it was decommissioned. The Greenbrier River Trail is located between the Greenbrier Resort in White Sulphur Springs and Lewisburg on Interstate 64 and was also a former railroad bed and right-of-way. Lewisburg is located near the junction of Routes 219 and Interstate 64. This is the same U.S. Route 219 we saw back in Pennsylvania in connection with Mahaffey Borough, which was located on U.S. Route 219 at the junction of the New York Central Railroad and the Hudson River Railroad. This was the beginning of me noticing that U.S. Route 219 was showing up at a lot of the places where my research was taking me to on the Trail of Giants in Appalachia and beyond, and which led me to intriguing connections with U.S. Highway 19 as well. What is now the Greenbrier River Trail was gifted to the state of West Virginia in the late 1970s and opened as a recreational multi-use trail in 1980. It runs between North Caldwell, which is 3 miles or 5 kilometers east of Lewisburg, on U.S. Route 60 slash Interstate 64, and Cass in eastern West Virginia. Cass, West Virginia was founded as a company town in 1901 for the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company and named for Joseph Kerr Cass, the vice president and co-founder of the Pulp and Paper Company. Most of the town named for Joseph K. Cass and its buildings were bought by the state of West Virginia in 1961 after the pulp and paper mill closed in 1960 and it became the Cass Scenic Railroad State Park. The Cass Scenic Railroad State Park continues to offer trips to Whitaker Station, the ghost town of Spruce, and Bald Knob, the highest point of the back Allegheny Mountain in Pocahontas County. Now I'm going to take a look at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia, on West Virginia Route 28 between the Durban Depot and the Cass Depot on this map. The National Radio Astronomy Observatory at Green Bank, situated near the S-shaped bends of the Greenbrier River, is part of the United States National Science Foundation, which is headquartered at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville and used for the purposes of radio astronomy. Besides Charlottesville and Green Bank, other National Radio Astronomy Observatories are located in Socorro, New Mexico, Tucson, Arizona, and San Pedro de Atacama, Chile. The Green Bank Telescope is the world's largest fully steerable radio telescope. Interesting to note that I found this bit of information in reference to the location of the Green Bank Observatory. The area around the observatory was at one time planted with pines with needles of a certain length to block electromagnetic interference at the wavelengths used there, which is a very intriguing find. The Green Bank National Radio Astronomy Observatory is in the National Radio Quiet Zone, in which radio transmissions are restricted by law. Researchers like Carl Jansky, credited with the discovery of radio waves coming from the Galactic Center at the Bell Labs Complex in Homedale, New Jersey, were credited with the development of radio astronomy, among other things. The Holmdale Complex, in use by Bell Labs for approximately 44 years, starting from around 1962, and was called the biggest mirror ever, and located near the entrance to Lower New York Bay. It is also located near Red Bank, New Jersey, where Carl Jansky died. Red Bank, New Jersey and Green Bank, West Virginia? 
a coincidence or not? The Bell Labs Homedale complex in New Jersey was also in an alignment with Montauk Point, where the experiments of the Montauk projects were said to have been carried out at the former Montauk Air Force Station, or Camp Hero State Park, and Brookhaven National Laboratory, where, among many other things, the relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, or RHIC, is located, the first and one of two operating heavy ion colliders, the other being CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, which the one in Brookhaven is the reverse of. The JFK International Airport, which sits beside Jamaica Bay, and is described as a partially man-made and partially natural estuary on the western tip of Long Island, and containing numerous marshy islands, Coney Island, and Philadelphia southwest of Bell Labs on the alignment. Besides much more along these lines throughout this area, there were three major historic trolley amusement parks alone on Brooklyn's Coney Island Peninsula, Dreamland, Luna Park, and Steeplechase Park, as well as the Brighton Beach Race Course. Historically, there was a very high concentration of Star Forts, trolley amusement parks, and lighthouses in this one location on Earth, between the entrance to the lower New York Bay at the Atlantic Ocean to the locations around the George Washington Bridge across the Hudson River alone, I have specifically looked at 11 star forts that are in pairs and or clusters, five major historic trolley amusement parks, and 11 lighthouses, and this does not include what was found of the same all the way up the Hudson River. Lighthouses were also part of the Earth's energy grid system and also have either been decommissioned, demolished, or are being used in a different capacity than what they were originally. I have come to believe that lighthouses were literally a house for light, for the purposes of precisely distributing the energy generated by this gigantic integrated system that existed all over the earth, that was in perfect alignment with everything on earth and in heaven. Back in West Virginia, one more thing about the location of the Green Bank National Radio Astronomy Observatory. It is also near Cheat Mountain. Cheat Mountain was once the home of the largest red spruce forest south of Maine. Cheat Mountain is flanked on the western side by our old friend U.S. Route 219 and on the eastern side by the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad. East to west it is crossed by U.S. Route 33 on one side and U.S. Route 250 on the other side. We are told that during the American Civil War Cheat Mountain was of strategic importance during the early part of the Operations in West Virginia campaign. The Battle of Cheat Mountain also known as the Battle of Cheat Summit Fort, took place between September 12th to 15th of 1861 and was the first battle that General Robert E. Lee led troops into combat, still a part of Virginia at the time, since what became the state of West Virginia was not formed until after the Civil War. Troops under Lee sought to regain Confederate territory that had been gained by the Union after Union troops had advanced into the western region of Virginia from Ohio. We are told that the Battle of Cheat Mountain was a Confederate attempt to regain the Union-occupied Fort Milroy on top of Cheat Mountain, but they were unsuccessful and lost the battle. Some interesting things turn up when we look at the view from above of this location. One is that there was a strip mine here at one time, as seen in the name of the trailhead notated next to the location of the fort. In this view we see the first of many patterns like this, with lines emanating out from a central point, in this case Cheat Summit Fort. In this current view of the area around Cheat Summit Fort from Google Earth, it is easier to see that it is at the meeting place of what appear to be several S-shaped rivers, and Barton Knob on the left-hand side was the location of strip mining prior to its acquisition by the Monongahela National Forest in 1986. Before the 1880s, the landscape was dominated by old-growth red spruce and red spruce northern hardwood forests. Starting in the 1880s until the 1940s, the vast majority of this forested land was clear-cut, after which the ecosystem was only 10% of its original range. This area was strip-mined between the 1950s and 1980s by the Mower Land and Lumber Company. Strip mining is the practice of mining a long strip of material by removing overlying soil and rock, most commonly used to mine coal. Barton Knob is also the location of an abandoned fire tower. We are told there has been a radio repeater at the same location since 2012. There are 79 registered former fire lookout sites in West Virginia alone. Many of these what are called fire 
or observation towers and their access roads were said to have been built by the CCC between 1933 and 1942, having received credit for building an estimated 250 of them. Like I said earlier in this video about the dams at the Moshannon State Forest, there's no doubt in my mind that the CCC and the other New Deal programs of FDRs during the Great Depression were being used to cover up the ancient advanced civilization. Apparently there were over 8,000 fire lookouts located in 49 states with only 2,000 remaining. Also, Cheat Bridge is in close proximity to the historic Cheat Summit Fort. Cheat Bridge is the name of an unincorporated community near U.S. Route 250's crossing of the Shavers Fork of the Cheat River. It was named for an historical bridge located here that was said to have been a pinned Pratt through truss bridge built in 1912 by the Canton Bridge Company of Canton, Ohio. The pinned Pratt through truss was said to have been developed in 1844 under the patent of Thomas and Caleb Pratt with diagonals in tensions, verticals in compression, except for the hip verticals immediately adjacent to the inclined end posts of the bridge. I have done a deep dive on the old world bridges of the new world in which I seriously question the narrative of who we are told built what and when in the bridge category of infrastructure. Cheat Bridge is also a stop for the Cheat Mountain Salamander Train, operated by the Durban and Greenbrier Valley Railroad, is a heritage and freight railroad that also offers passenger service. Cheat Bridge was also a part of the Stanton-Parkersburg Turnpike, which was first established as a toll road sometime around the mid-1800s. This 1848 article is advertising stagecoach service on the Stanton-Parkersburg Turnpike not the first turnpike toll road we've seen early in the history of the United States, and not the last one we will see, where they are charging currency for the use of the roadway. The last thing I would like to mention about the Cheat Mountain location before I move on from here is this. The Cheat River runs along this section of West Virginia between the state's border with both Pennsylvania and Maryland. Aaron sent me this reference to giant skeletons having been uncovered in the location of the Cheat River. The first reference was a Tucker County resident finding giant bones protruding from the ground in the area on the Cheat River known as Horseshoe in 1774 that he estimated would have been from someone eight feet or almost two and a half meters tall when he laid them out. Also, other settlers found large-sized bones nearby in what was described as an ancient village that had earthen and stone mounds earning the area the nickname Giant Town. Back in Huntington, West Virginia, near the New River Gorge, and named for Big Four Railroader Collis P. Huntington, it was one of the first American cities to have electric streetcars, with service believed to have started around the end of 1888. Then, starting in the 1920s, the Ohio Valley Electric Railway had organized a gas-powered bus service, which by November of 1937 had completely replaced all of Huntington's former electric streetcar lines. Exactly the same story we saw back in Hoboken, where we saw that by August of 1949, electric streetcars had been replaced by buses in a process known as bustitution. Also, Camden Park in Huntington first opened as a trolley park in 1903. It was said to have been first established as a picnic spot by the Camden Interstate Railway Company in 1903 which was a street railway and interurban system that ran between Huntington, West Virginia and Ashland, Kentucky, and which by 1916 was owned by the Ohio Valley Electric Railway, who became new owners of the park. Today, Camden Park is one of 13 remaining trolley parks that remain open in the United States, long minus trolleys, and the only operating amusement park in West Virginia. Like what we saw in Hoboken, New Jersey, locations of historical trolley parks, of which there were an estimated 2,000 at one time, are long gone. I couldn't find one when I was looking for a map showing the Ohio Valley Electric Railway lines, but I did find one for the Ohio Electric Railway. This is what we are told about the Ohio Electric Railway as one of many of the same stories. It was formed in 1907 upon the consolidation of 14 smaller interurban railways, at its peak, it operated 617 miles, or 993 kilometers, of track. The company went bankrupt in 1921 and dissolved into their constituent companies. Eventually, all the interurban lines went away. Everywhere.
I have marked with red dots the hubs of interurban lines, where three or more lines meet at a central point. Along with the tallest skeleton by far being 18 feet or 5.5 meters tall at West Hickory in Pennsylvania, which I will be looking at later in this video, of the 10 featured on this graphic, three are in the vicinity of where we have been looking at around Huntington, West Virginia. Number 10 on the list was found at the Great Serpent Mound at 7 feet or a little over 2 meters tall. Number 9 at Cresap Mound in West Virginia at 7 feet 2 inches tall still a little over two meters, and number six at Miamisburg, Ohio, at a little over eight feet or two and a half meters tall. These giant skeleton findings are consistent with other recorded giant skeleton finds in the surrounding area, with some reported to have been found at mounds and some randomly found frequently in proximity to rivers. The next place I'm going to look at in West Virginia is Fairmont, the seat of Marion County. Fairmont is located just above the confluence of where the West Fork and Tigert Valley rivers meet to form the Monongahela River. I couldn't help but notice all the S-shaped river bends going on around here, meeting in the vicinity of Fairmont. So I searched for more information on Fairmont's railroad history, and this is what I found. First, the Fairmont and Clarksburg Electric Railroad was an interurban electric streetcar system that served the Fairmont and Clarksburg areas linked by a main line and connected the communities of Bridgeport, Fairview, Mannington, and Weston. It offered both passenger and freight services and connected communities and coal camps. It became operational in 1901. We are told that now the electric streetcar services just could not compete with the advent of automobiles reducing demand for these services and this inner urban streetcar system was abandoned entirely by 1947 when the system had transitioned entirely to bus services. This was the crossing of this interurban line at Hawkenberry Run near Reevesville. In time, the Fairmont and Clarksburg Electric Railroad was managed by the larger West Penn Railway System of electric streetcars that was headquartered in Connellsville, Pennsylvania, and was said to be part of the region's power generation utility. It consisted of 339 miles or 546 kilometers of electric streetcar track at its height. It was operational from 1904 to 1952. Next, the Fairmont, Morgantown, and Pittsburgh Railroad once connected Fairmont to Uniontown in Pennsylvania, a distance of 56 miles or 17 kilometers. It became operational in 1894. We are told the importance of this line waned as the coal mines along the route closed, and in 1953 passenger service ended. By 1991, most of the line between Fairmont and Uniontown was abandoned, with the exception of two short stretches that are still in use today by CSX for freight transportation. This map of the Industrial Heartland Trails Coalition's Parkersburg to Pittsburgh, or P2P corridor, shows its plan to have a fully connected recreational rail-to-trail between the two cities with the proposed segments overlaid in red. I have put a blue box around the Fairmont to Uniontown segment of the former railroad line and a red box around the section between the West Fork River Trail which starts just outside of Fairmont and goes to Parkersburg and includes the previously mentioned North Bend Rail Trail. Aaron sent me this information on page 10 in the History of Marion County the information on this page referred to workmen preparing to build a bridge unearthed three giant skeletons measuring over seven feet or two meters in length in the village of Reevesville at Paw Paw Creek and Fort Hill about two miles or three kilometers north of Fairmont and traces of an aboriginal fort. The only fort I can find any information on to speak of near Fairmont is Prickett's Fort which just happens to be the same distance north of Fairmont that is referenced on the History of Marion County page. Prickett's Fort State Park is at the confluence of the Monongahela and Prickett's Creek. What the historical narrative tells us is that it was a reconstructed refuge fort built on Jacob Prickett's homestead to defend local settlers from hostile Indian raids and these days commemorates life on the Virginia frontier in the late 18th century. A couple of interesting things to note about the Prickett's Fort location. First is that the site of the fort is located on a river bend right next to an old railroad bridge that is now part of the Marion County Rail Trail and there are railroad tracks right next to the Monongahela River 
still in use by the Fairmont subdivision, a railroad from Grafton to Reevesville that is owned and operated by CSX Transportation on what used to be part of the B&O Railroad mainline. Sounds a lot like what we saw back at Cheat Mountain, with the Cheat Summit Fort, the bridge, and the railroad tracks. The Marion County Rail Trail runs for two and a half miles or four kilometers from the Prickett's Fort State Park along Prickett's Creek through rural Marion County to Fairmont. The trail's main highlight is a 1,200 foot or 366 meter long lighted tunnel which runs under Speedway Avenue and Suncrest Boulevard, said to have been built in 1914 by the Monongahela Railroad. The land for the trail was purchased from the railroad by the county in 1989. The last thing I would like to mention in this part of West Virginia, all in the vicinity of the Bogs of Cranberry Glades, is that there is a pattern of north-south oriented, perfectly straight parallel lines that are detectable in the landscape on Google Earth that Aaron had noticed and sent me this screenshot of. I followed the straight lines visible at Cranberry Glades northwards. While not directly north of it, Pittsburgh isn't far away from being due north of Cranberry Glades. In addition, here's a screenshot of the same kind of parallel lines appearing in the landscape west of Gettysburg that Aaron found, the historical location of a very famous Civil War battle. It would make sense that these massive parallel lines that are part of the landscape were also part of the Earth's original energy grid system. Now I'm going to return to the area around the bog of Black Moshannon State Park and take another look there for the purposes of comparison to the area around Cranberry Glades. Black Moshannon State Park is 22 miles or 35 kilometers from State College, Pennsylvania, which is only a difference of 2 miles or 4 kilometers of the distance between the bogs at Cranberry Glades and the community of White Sulphur Springs with its luxurious and exclusive Greenbrier Resort. State College, Pennsylvania is the home of Penn State University. It is connected to Phillipsburg and Black Moshannon State Park via Pennsylvania U.S. Route 322. Penn State was founded in 1855 as the Farmers High School of Pennsylvania and in 1863 it became the state's first land-grant university. Besides U.S. Route 322, State College is surrounded by U.S. Route 220, also part of I-99, and state routes like 550, 150, 45, and 26. State College is also surrounded by S-shaped watercourses like Spring Creek, Buffalo Run, and Slab Cabin Run. Now, a word about the United States numbered highway system also known as the Federal Highway System, that we have already seen examples of come up in this video. It was actually called an integrated network of roads and highways numbered within a nationwide grid across the contiguous United States. It was first approved in 1926. Drawn up in 1913 by the National Highway Association, the map was said to be the first proposed U.S. highway network map. The red roads were delineated main national highways the blue roads trunk national highways, and the yellow roads were link national highways to connect all the mains and trunks. The nation's first federal highways would not be adopted until 1926 when the American Association of State Highway Officials approved the first plans for the numbered highway system, with this section showing Texas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. I have blue arrows pointing to major cities that are the central point of at least five highways. Dallas, Texas, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Little Rock, Arkansas, Memphis, Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee, and Birmingham, Alabama. What we see happening with the highway system of certain cities being the central point of multiple highways is also seen with rail lines, as we have also seen thus far, like the example seen previously of the Ohio Electric Railway lines. This Civil War era example shows that Petersburg in Virginia, just south of Richmond, was the central point of multiple rail lines emanating from it in all directions. Petersburg was the focal point of the railroads that supplied Richmond during the Civil War and was the primary target for the Union Army in Virginia from the last half of 1864 until April of 1865. The third major Civil War fire was the April 2nd of 1865 burning of Richmond the capital of Virginia and of the Confederate States of America, also known as the Evacuation Fire and the Fall of Richmond, Richmond was set on fire on the night of April 2nd by Confederate forces 
after Confederate President Jefferson Davis was said to have ordered the burning of warehouses and bridges after Union General Ulysses S. Grant had taken nearby Petersburg. This is a lithograph depicting it by Courier and Ives. In our historical narrative, the Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to General Grant days later on April 9, 1865, after his final defeat at the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse that same day. And where there have been toll roads in one form or another for a long time, since this subject has been coming up as well. Since 1958, that section of I-95 has been known as the Richmond-Petersburg Turnpike, but there have been toll roads in the area since 1826. Two other major fires in history have come down to us as acts of war during the American Civil War. The first was the burning of Atlanta, which we are told took place in 1864, an important rail and commercial center at the time of the Civil War. General Sherman and his Union forces captured the city of Atlanta on September 2nd of 1864 and occupied it from then until November of 1864. He gave orders to destroy Atlanta as a transportation hub and as a war material manufacturing center, and in particular the railroad system and everything connected to it. His orders were carried out, destroying physical infrastructure, and on November 15th everything that had been destroyed was set on fire. Like Petersburg and Richmond, Atlanta was a railway hub at the time of the Civil War and is a highway hub today. Then, after Atlanta was burned down by General Sherman and his troops in November, the following February, Columbia, the capital of South Carolina, and an important political and supply center for the Confederacy, was said to have surrendered to General Sherman on February 17, 1865, after the Battle of Rivers Bridge. On the same day, the fires started burning much of Columbia, though there is disagreement between historians regarding whether or not the fires on that day were accidental or intentional. But on the following day, General Sherman's forces destroyed anything of military value, including railroad depots, warehouses, arsenals, and machine shops. Like Petersburg and Richmond and Atlanta, Columbia was a transportation hub with regards to rail infrastructure and a highway hub today. Were these places specifically targeted for destruction because of their importance as transportation and infrastructure hubs on the energy grid during the historical event known to us as the American Civil War, and were not destroyed for the reasons we have always been told? Now back to State College in Pennsylvania. As I mentioned previously, besides state and U.S. routes, State College is also surrounded by S-shaped water courses like Spring Creek, Buffalo Run, and Slab Cabin Run. And yes, there is a railroad history to be found in the area around State College, too. Whereas West Virginia was mined exhaustively for its coal, this part of Pennsylvania came to be mined exhaustively for its iron ore. Andrew Carnegie had begun mining iron ore in Scotia in 1881 for his steel mills in Pittsburgh. And by 1887, we are told that a new era of iron making in the Nittany Valley began with the opening of the Nittany and Belfonte furnaces along Buffalo Run near its junction with Spring Creek and three railroads that were said to have been constructed to haul the iron ore to them. The Belfonte Central, BFC, Central Railroad, CRR, and Nittany Valley Railroad, NV. By 1911, both of these furnaces had been shut down. By 1950, all the railroads that had once served the area either for the iron-related industry or passenger service, including the Pennsylvania Railroad lines, circled in blue, were no longer in service. The only rail here that became operational again was a portion of the Belfonte Central, after the Belfonte Historical Railroad was organized as an excursion line in 1985, and occasionally offers runs as a tourist attraction. I also looked to see if Penn State University has an underground tunnel system, and it does though its origin seems mysterious for some reason. We are told that there is a system of tunnels said to have been built for maintenance purposes, and many of which are used today to generate steam to heat the Penn State sidewalks and keep them clear of snow in the wintertime, and other tunnels for other maintenance purposes. Interesting to note that the Garfield Thomas Water Tunnel, the world's largest water tunnel at the time it was built in cooperation with the Navy in 1949, is at Penn State, and for a long time, it was the largest circulating water tunnel in the world. It is still one of the Navy's principal experimental hydrodynamic research facilities, 
and it has been declared a historic mechanical engineering landmark. The Garfield Thomas Water Tunnel, the world's largest water tunnel at the time it was built, sounds like what we saw back in Green Bank, West Virginia, with the world's largest fully steerable telescope at the Radio Astronomy Observatory there. Not only that, but both locations are in close proximity to U.S. Route 219, the bogs at Black Moshannon State Park and the bogs at Cranberry Glades. Green Bank is close to Cheat Mountain, and Penn State is close to Mount Nittany, which are geographically close to Mount Pocono. Mount Nittany near Penn State was said to have gotten its name from the Algonquin word nit a meaning single mountain. For the purposes of comparison for similarity, I recently found a different university with tunnels on a route near a single mountain. In this photo of the Wake Forest University campus, you can see the Wake Chapel building in a direct alignment with Pilot Mountain in the background. The tunnels at Wake Forest University were also said to have been built for heating and maintenance purposes. They have tours, but they are typically not open for public view. Pilot Mountain, which was just pictured in alignment with the Wake Chapel on the Wake Forest campus, is described as one of the most distinctive natural features in the state of North Carolina, with two distinctive features, one named Big Pinnacle and the other Little Pinnacle. It is seen here centered on U.S. Route 52. U.S. Route 52 follows a northwest to southeast route across the country. The northwestern terminus of U.S. Route 52 is in Portal, North Dakota, in the Bakken oil field region, and on the international border with Canada at North Portal, Saskatchewan, where we find the historic Sioux Line going through North Dakota from northwest to southeast, quite similar to the route of U.S. 52. On its southeasterly journey across the United States, U.S. Route 52 passes through places like Indianapolis, Indiana, another large central hub of transportation routes. Pilot Mountain in North Carolina, as previously mentioned, to the southeastern terminus of U.S. 52 in Charleston, South Carolina, at Number 2 Meeting Street and White Point Harbor at the Battery along the Charleston Harbor, not far from the place the American Civil War started, at Fort Sumter, in Charleston Harbor on April 12th of 1861. Peter Shampoo has done incredible work on specific ley lines in North America and other continents as well, as seen on his website, geometryofplace.com. Peter shows Pilot Mountain in North Carolina as a hub for ley lines on the home page of his website, looking much like the cities we are seeing that service transportation hubs for multiple rail lines and or highways. Pilot Mountain is described as a quartzite monadnock. This translates to a hard metamorphic rock that was originally pure quartz sandstone that is an isolated rock hill, knob, ridge, or small mountain that rises abruptly from a gently sloping or virtually level surrounding plain. Here are some other examples of places classified as monadnocks. Besides Pilot Mountain on the top left, Hartigan in Norway is seen on the top right Devil's Tower in Wyoming on the bottom left, and Kurura in Australia on the bottom right. What if Monadnock is a word used to cover up gigantic tree stumps? What if other mounts that we have seen thus far, like Mount Pocono and even Cheat Mountain, are also in that category? And if so, what was their significance to this video about the energy grid? I believe the example of Pilot Mountain being a hub of ley lines provides a significant clue for us. Here are some examples of giant trees and stumps that are identified as such. In this comparison, we have the Devil's Tower from another angle on the left, the Jugurtha Tableland in Tunisia in the middle, and the volcano in the middle of the city of Hammam Damt in Yemen looking very tree stumpish. Pilot Mountain State Park is on the western end of what are called the Sora Town Mountains, named after the Sora or Chira people, the Suan-speaking indigenous people who lived here before the arrival of Europeans and considered extinct as a tribe, so they are left only in place names in the region. The Sora Town Mountains are described as an isolated mountain range, sometimes called the mountains away from the mountains, and consisting of heavily forested ridges frequently broken by large quartzite rock cliffs. Interesting to note that a viewer left me a comment that before it was called Pilot Mountain, it was known as Mount Ararat. 
I looked into it and found the historic Ararat River with rail infrastructure running beside it on the top left, and today's Ararat River Greenway Trail, where the railroad used to be on the bottom right. The Ararat River Greenway Trail is at the eastern edge of the city of Mount Airy, and we previously saw a place called Mount Airy Casino Resort earlier in this video at Mount Pocono. The only Mount Ararat I have ever heard of is in modern Turkey today, and historic Armenia in the past, the legendary landing place of Noah's Ark. What's Mount Ararat doing in North Carolina? And why was the name changed to Pilot Mountain? Way back when I believed the narrative, I probably would have accepted it as being a named after situation, but not anymore. Mount Airy, North Carolina was Andy Griffith's hometown, and the place Mayberry was based on in the Andy Griffith Show. Next, I'm going to take a look at Altoona in Pennsylvania, just down the road from State College and Penn State University. Altoona is only 43 miles or 70 kilometers southwest of State College. Altoona was said to have been established by the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1849. Aaron drew my attention to Altoona with information he sent me about the nearby Horseshoe Curve. The Horseshoe Curve is a three-track railroad curve that is described as one of the world's most incredible engineering feats and was accomplished by the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1854 as a way to reduce the westbound grade to the summit of the Allegheny Mountains. It was said to have replaced the original Allegheny Portage Railroad, which was said to be the first railroad constructed through the Allegheny Mountains in 1834, and which was 36 miles, or 58 kilometers long, and connected to the Pennsylvania Canal. Considered a technological marvel in its day, and critical to opening the way to commerce and settlement past the Appalachian Mountains, the original Allegheny Portage Railroad consisted of a series of five inclines on either side of the ridge line from Blair Gap to Crescent Summit alongside what is called the Little Conemaugh River to where it meets the Conemaugh River at Johnstown. This is the same kind of infrastructure as the Ashley Plains seen previously that were said to have been built by the Lehigh Coal Mine Company between 1837 and 1838 for use in transporting millions of tons of anthracite coal over the Wilkes-Barre Mountain. Interesting things to note along the historic route of the Allegheny Portage Railroad include the Skew Arch Bridge, which we come to after leaving the main canal location of Hollidaysburg and going up towards Crescent Summit, and called the only purposefully built bridge on the portage, and crossed over the railway. The Skew Arch Bridge was said to have been built in the 1830s, and was also part of the early road system, said to have gotten its name for its shape when it was being built from a bend in yet another turnpike, the Huntington, Cambria, and Indiana Turnpike which was said to have been first authorized in 1810. Today, the Skew Arch Bridge is preserved in the middle of old U.S. Route 22 and the new U.S. Route 22. U.S. Route 22 is an east-west numbered highway from 1926 that runs from Cincinnati in Ohio to Newark in New Jersey and passes through West Virginia and Pennsylvania on the way. In Pennsylvania, U.S. 22 follows the route of the historic William Penn Highway, which was officially dedicated on November 15th of 1916, that ran parallel to the Pennsylvania Railroad through most of Pennsylvania. First established in 1846, at its peak in 1882, the Pennsylvania Railroad was the largest railroad, transportation enterprise, and corporation in the world. This map of the extent of the Pennsylvania Railroad was dated November 3rd of 1857, which would have been four years before the start of the American Civil War. But seeing a side-by-side -side comparison of these two maps, it certainly appears as though most of US-22 is on or right near to what used to be the main railroad line for the Pennsylvania Railroad. The next landmark in the Allegheny Portage Railroad's journey through the Allegheny Mountains is the summit at Crescent, a borough on top of the Eastern Continental Divide. US Route 22 is one of the highways that accesses Crescent. Back in the industrial heyday of the late 19th century and early 20th century, there were lumber, coal, and coke-yard industries located in Crescent. Wealthy Pittsburgh businessmen like Andrew Carnegie, Henry Clay Frick, and Charles Schwab, all connected to each other through the steel industry, had summer residences here, like Carnegie's Braemar Cottage in Crescent. Like what we saw at Mount Pocono in Pennsylvania, with resorts like the long-gone Pocono Mountain House in Springs, and White Sulphur Springs in West Virginia, with the Greenbrier Luxury Resort that is still very much with us, Crescent was known for its therapeutic mineral springs, 
and we are told that in 1881 the Pennsylvania Railroad opened the Mountain House Resort Hotel. Carnegie's Braemar Cottage is still standing on the 400-acre property, which had 32 lots for private cottages. What we are told is that the reason for the demise of the Mountain House Resort Hotel and Crescent Springs was that America's appetite for mountain or inland resorts began to decline in favor of beach resorts, just like canals falling by the wayside for railroads, and railroads the same for automobiles, and so on. The Mountain House Resort Hotel had ceased operations by the early 1900s, and in 1916 it was completely razed to the ground, and the original hotel building was gone. Interesting to note that unlike the luxurious Mountain House Resort Hotel that got raised to the ground, the likewise spacious building of the former Crescent Sanitarium and Prison is still standing, albeit in pretty rough shape these days. The building is located on Old Route 22. After the former Allegheny Portage Railroad left the summit at Crescent, it descended in elevation into Johnstown along the Little Conemaugh River and we come to South Fork at the Little Conemaw River and what was the former location of the South Fork Dam. The famous Johnstown flood on May 31, 1889, the worst flood in the United States in the 19th century, was caused by the catastrophic failure of the South Fork Dam and was the second major disaster the American Red Cross responded to, which was founded in May of 1881. John D. Rockefeller was amongst several that donated to create a national headquarters for the American Red Cross near the White House in Washington, D.C., said to have been built between 1915 and 1917. The South Fork Dam was said to have been an earthwork built between 1838 and 1853 as part of a canal system as a reservoir for a canal basin in Johnstown by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But then, after spending 15 years building the dam, it was abandoned by the Commonwealth and sold to the Pennsylvania Railroad, who turned around and sold it to private interests. In 1881, speculators had bought the abandoned reservoir and built a clubhouse called the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club and Cottages, turning it into an exclusive retreat for 61 steel and coal financiers from Pittsburgh, including Andrew Carnegie, Andrew Mellon, and Henry Clay Frick. The South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club was a Pennsylvania corporation and owned the South Fork Dam. Henry Clay Frick was a founding member of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club and was actually said to have been largely responsible for the alterations to the South Fork Dam that led to its failure. South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club members and friends, Andrew Carnegie, the sixth wealthiest American in history according to CNN Business with an adjusted wealth of $101 billion, and Andrew Mellon, the 15th wealthiest American according to the same source, with an adjusted wealth of $63.2 billion, and Henry Clay Frick, had all been initiated into Freemasonry. I keep bringing up these Freemasonry ties because I absolutely have no doubt in my mind of the connection between Freemasonry and everything that has taken place here. What we are told is that the South Fork Dam failed after days of unusually heavy rain and 14.3 million tons of water from the reservoir of Lake Conemaugh devastated the South Fork Valley including Johnstown, 12 miles or 19 kilometers downstream from the dam, killing an estimated 2,209 people and causing $17 million in damages in 1889, which would be $490 million in 2020. Though there were years of claims and litigation, the elite and wealthy members of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club were never found liable for damages. In 1904, the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club Corporation was disbanded and assets sold at a public auction by the sheriff, and there were permanent exhibits in many places, like Atlantic City, depicting the horrors of the Johnstown flood experience for public consumption, billed as a thrilling account of the awful floods and their appalling ruin. Johnstown is located 57 miles or 92 kilometers east of Pittsburgh at the confluence of the Conemaugh and the Stony Creek Rivers. This is a map of the 1889 Johnstown flood direction from the National Park Service. Massive debris is marked at the Stone Bridge location. The Stone Bridge is a seven-arch railroad bridge that was said to have been constructed by the Pennsylvania Railroad between 1887 and 1888. The Stone Bridge itself survived the flood, but it trapped all kinds of debris, including miles of barbed wire that had been swept away by the raging floodwaters. From 1834 to 1854, Johnstown was a key transfer point on the Pennsylvania Main Line Canal. At the head of the canal's western branch, 
canal boats were transported over the mountains by the Allegheny Portage Railroad to continue the trip by water to Pittsburgh at the forks of the Ohio and on to the Ohio River Valley. More on the forks of the Ohio to come in this video. Both Johnstown on one side of the Allegheny Portage Railroad and the Horseshoe Curve near Altoona on the other side might have operational remnants of the original incline railway system, though that's not what we're told about them. The Johnstown inclined plane was said to have been designed by Hungarian-American engineer Samuel Descher and completed in 1891 to serve as an escape route from floods in the valley at the confluence of the Conemaugh and Stony Creek rivers and to connect Johnstown with the borough of Westmont on Yoder Hill. Samuel Descher was also credited with the design of four of Pittsburgh's 17 original inclines, of which only two remain, the Monongahela and Duquesne inclines on Mount Washington, another mount to wonder about. Billed as the world's steepest vehicular inclined plane, its slope has a grade of 71.9%, and the Johnstown incline takes only 90 seconds for it to travel in between the two stations pretty darn fast. The Johnstown Incline is closed for rehabilitation work, now projected to be completed in 2024. The Inclined Plain Railway back at Horseshoe Curve near Altoona was said to have been built in the 1990s to take tourists up to the park above to get a scenic view of the incredible engineering feat by the Pennsylvania Railroad circa 1854 of the Horseshoe Curve and its three tracks that eliminated the need for the Allegheny Portage Railroad's tin incline planes. Like the one at Johnstown, this incline has been closed for repairs and is also expected to reopen in 2024. Incline railways work like an obliquely angled elevator in which cables attached to a pulley system raise and lower the cars along the grade. Two cars are paired at opposite ends and act as each other's counterweight. As such, there is not a need for traction between the wheels and rails and thereby allows them to scale steep slopes, unlike traditional rail cars. Thing is, there used to be way more of them than there are now. And inclined railways were a worldwide thing. Now they are mostly either tourist attractions or kept on as an important part of a community's transportation infrastructure from low ground to high ground. I looked at the subject of inclined railways in depth in this video, Incline Railways of the Past and Present. Like the canals, railroads, electric streetcars, trolley parks, and luxurious holiday resorts of the past, most of the world's incline railways were largely made to go away for one reason or another. Back in Johnstown, come to find out that the main highway connecting Johnstown to the Pennsylvania Turnpike is once again our old friend U.S. Route 219. It would appear that certain U.S. highway routes were particularly important to the controllers. This is a great place to revisit the U.S. numbered highway system and see what comes up to the surface. First up, a deeper look into U.S. 219. U.S. Route 219 is a spur of U.S. Route 19. It is 535 miles or 861 kilometers long and runs from West Seneca, New York at the eastern end of Lake Erie south of Buffalo and ends at Bluefield, Virginia, right across the state border from Bluefield, West Virginia. In West Virginia, U.S. 219 is said to follow what was known as the Seneca Trail, a network of trails of unknown age used by indigenous Americans for commerce, trading, and communication. The Seneca Trail ran through the Appalachian Valley from what was to become Upper New York State and went well into Alabama, though they are described to us in our historical narrative strictly as footpaths. What we are told is that by the time the land was settled by Europeans starting in the 18th century, it was largely abandoned by its previous inhabitants. So we've already seen where U.S. 219 is a highway corridor that links the bogs of Black Moshannon State Park near Penn State University and State College and Cranberry Glades near White Sulphur Springs and the Greenbrier Resort. Both of these boggy lands are located in close proximity to former railroad infrastructure with the previously seen snowshoe rail to trails at Moshannon Creek and the Greenbrier rails to trails running along U.S. 219 and the Greenbrier River near Cranberry Glades. U.S. 219 meets up with U.S. 19 at Bluefield in Virginia, of which there is one city on the other side of Virginia's border in West Virginia with that name as well. The land beneath the two Bluefields contains the richest deposit of bituminous coal in the world, known as the Pocahontas Coal Field, or the Flat Top Pocahontas Coal Field, named after the Flat Top Mountain on U.S. 19 in West Virginia and Pocahontas, Virginia, where the first coal seam here was discovered. 
Bituminous coal is the second rank of coal after anthracite and contains bitumen, also known as asphalt. It is the most abundant rank of coal found around the world and used primarily for electrical power generation and in the steel industry. The Pocahontas coal field started to be mined in 1882. Pocahontas in Virginia was named after the famous daughter of Chief Powhatan in connection with the 17th century Jamestown colony, we are told, the first permanent English settlement in the Americas. This is the most famous depiction of Pocahontas from her time on the left, but this is how we've been taught to see Pocahontas and her father on the right. We are told that Bluefield in West Virginia, with its great location with respect to the developing Pocahontas coal field, was selected as the location of a major division point on the Norfolk and Western Railway in the late 19th century, and that the railroad greatly stimulated the town's growth, so much so that in its heyday, Bluefield was considered a little New York. Next, I'm going to take a deeper look at the U.S. Route 19, starting at its northern terminus, and then come back to Bluefield and continue the journey southward on U.S. 19. Now, on to more about U.S. Route 19. The north-south U.S. Route 19 runs from its northern terminus at U.S. Route 20 at Lake Erie in Erie, Pennsylvania, to its southern terminus at an interchange with U.S. 41 in Memphis, Florida, just south of St. Petersburg. Erie is located just about right in between Cleveland, Ohio, which is 90 miles or 140 kilometers southwest of Erie, and Buffalo, New York, 80 miles or 130 kilometers northeast on the southern shore of Lake Erie. Pittsburgh is 128 miles or 206 kilometers south of Erie. Erie was an important railroad hub during the mid-19th century. We are told the first railroad station in Erie was established in 1851 and replaced in 1866 by the Romanesque Revival Union Depot, seen on the left, which was demolished in 1925. The current Art Deco Union Station in Erie on the right was said to have opened in 1927 and designed by Fellheimer and Wagner, an architectural firm credited with a bunch of railroad stations between 1923 and 1940. Today, it looks like what was the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie line followed what is now Pennsylvania State Route 18 going south out of Girard on its way to Pittsburgh. US 19 is just east of there, going south from Erie on its way to Pittsburgh, and Pennsylvania State Route 8 leaves Erie and heads south through Titusville on its way to the greater Pittsburgh area. Back in Erie, one more place I want to mention is Waldemir Park and Water World. Like Camden Park in Huntington, West Virginia, it is billed as one of only 13 trolley parks still operating as an amusement park in the United States. But what we see today is not what they used to be. Waldemere Park was first leased as a trolley park in 1896 by the Erie Electric Motor Company and is the fourth oldest amusement park in Pennsylvania and the tenth oldest in the United States. Waldemere has operated continuously since then under different owners, but the trolleys of the park are long gone. Trolley parks were said to have started in the United States in the 19th century as picnic and recreation areas at the ends of streetcar lines and were precursors to today's amusement parks. They were said to have been created by streetcar companies for reasons like giving people a reason to use their services on weekends. By 1919, there were estimated to be between 1,500 and 2,000 such parks. But like what we've already seen, these magnificent trolley parks went the way of the dinosaur too, along with countless electric streetcar lines canals, railroad lines, and historic resorts. I have come to believe that they were somehow involved with recharging the Earth's energy grid for the original civilization in a really fun way, as they were located at the end terminals of streetcar lines, and were just utilized by the bringers in of the world's new system for a short time until they were no longer needed, or just plain inconvenient to the new narrative. So in this example, dozens of trolley parks were operating at one time in this part of Pennsylvania, just in the location alone between Erie and Pittsburgh, much less everywhere else. One of Pittsburgh's first amusement parks, Aliquippa Park, was said to have been established sometime in the 1880s by the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad as a way to bolster ridership, but by 1905 had fallen into disrepair, and the land was purchased by the Jones and Laughlin Steel Corporation that year to construct the Aliquippa Works. Giant skeletons were uncovered here in the past as well, as reported on in this newspaper article. And now I'm going to put this area near Erie and US 19 into the perspective of this new system in our historical narrative with its proximity to Titusville, which we come to going south out of Erie on Pennsylvania State Route 8. 
The petroleum industry in the United States began in earnest in 1859 when Edwin Drake found oil on a piece of leased land near Titusville, Pennsylvania, in what is now called Oil Creek State Park. For this reason, Titusville is called the birthplace of the oil industry, and for a number of years this part of Pennsylvania was the leading oil-producing region in the world. Today, not surprisingly, the Oil Creek State Park Trail runs on the bed of the first railroad line to reach Titusville, the Oil Creek Railroad. Samuel Keir had established America's first oil refinery in Pittsburgh in 1854 for making lamp oil, just five years before oil was found in Titusville. So it certainly appears like the petroleum industry was developed in the 1850s in order to provide a replacement energy technology for the free energy technology of the original civilization, roughly a decade after the birth of the oil industry at Titusville in 1870, John D. Rockefeller, along with Henry Flagler, an American industrialist and major developer in the state of Florida, founded the Standard Oil Company, an American oil-producing, transporting, refining, and marketing company. Oil was used in the form of kerosene throughout the country as a light source and heat source until the introduction of electricity and as a fuel source for the automobile with the first gas-powered automobile having been patented by Carl Benz in 1886. John D. Rockefeller Sr., who was born in the United States in 1839, was the progenitor of the wealthy Rockefeller family. He was considered to be the wealthiest American of all time, as seen in this ranking by CNN Business. Rockefeller's wealth soared as kerosene and gasoline grew in importance. At his peak, he controlled 90% of all oil. As quickly as possible, a way was found to replace what remained of the free energy system with their own coal and oil-based system, and in the process make money hand over fist from the total control of the new system. West Hickory is 14 miles or 23 kilometers southeast of Titusville and 12 miles or 20 kilometers east of Oil Creek State Park in Oil City. West Hickory in Pennsylvania was the location of where the tallest recorded skeleton in North America was unearthed at 18 feet or five and a half meters tall. Aaron sent me this article from the Oil City Times from the Marysville Tribune of Marysville, Ohio, dated January 26th of 1870. Two men excavating near West Hickory in preparation for erecting a derrick first exhumed an enormous rusty helmet of iron. And then they unearthed a nine foot or almost three meter long sword. So they made the hole bigger and soon came upon the bones of two enormous feet. After a few hours they unearthed the well-preserved skeleton of an enormous human. The bones of the skeleton were described as remarkably white, the double teeth all in place of extraordinary size, and that when the giant was alive he must have stood 18 feet or five and a half meters in stockings. The relics were being viewed in nearby Tionesta before being sent on to New York. In a similar configuration at the confluence of rivers as we have been seeing, like what we saw earlier in Fairmont, West Virginia, located where the S-shaped West Fork and Tigert Valley Rivers meet to form the S-shaped Monongahela River pictured on the right, West Hickory on the left is located on the S-shaped Allegheny River right before it meets the S-shaped Tionesta Creek at the borough of Tionesta. From there, the Allegheny River goes on to meet the Monongahela River at the forks of the Ohio and Pittsburgh, where they form the confluence of the Ohio River. There were two star forts, known to us as Fort Duquesne and Fort Pitt, where there are well-preserved masonry banks on both sides of today's Point State Park, appearing as if these were canals, as seen on the bottom right. Looking just like what we see in Pittsburgh at the forks of the Ohio, on the top left is a photo of the Monocacy Railroad Junction in Maryland circa 1873, and on the bottom right is a photo of the confluence of the Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers in Des Moines, Iowa, one of countless examples of so-called river confluences that look exactly like this. A junction is defined as an act of joining or adjoining things, implying intentionality as opposed to something that just happens randomly. An electrical junction is defined as a point or area where multiple conductors or semiconductors make physical contact. It took some digging because it was hard to find out this information, but I was able to find a reference to a railroad history in this part of Pennsylvania near West Hickory in Forest County in neighboring Warren County. Among showing other railroads running along rivers and creeks throughout the county, it shows a railroad along the Allegheny River where the red arrow is pointing. Today's US-62 runs along the Allegheny River through here. 
US 62 is an east-west United States numbered highway that runs from the Mexican border at El Paso, Texas, all the way to Niagara Falls, New York, near the Canadian border. It passes right through Oil City, Tionesta, and West Hickory, where it runs along the Allegheny River for 45 miles, or 72 kilometers. Important to note here that at the end of US 62 in New York, there was an historic train route at Niagara Falls called the Niagara Belt Line, which traversed the Niagara Gorge. Today, you can take a leisurely stroll at the Whitewater Walk, where the Niagara Belt Line once was. While we are still here in this part of Pennsylvania, this is a good place to mention that this is the historical land of the Susquehannock people. The Susquehannock people were known for their height. This was not a secret. On the left is a size comparison between a Susquehannock skeleton compared with a European-sized skeleton. One last place I want to look at before I go back to continue down US-19 where we left off at Bluefield, Virginia, is Gornaya Sharia on a different continent in Siberia. Aaron sent me photos of Gornaya Sharia to bring it to my attention regarding its similarity to these rock formations we keep seeing in state parks in North America. Here is Boxcar Rocks in Pennsylvania on the left compared with Gornaya Sharia on the right. Gornaya Sharia is found in Russia in southern Siberia east of the Altai Mountains and is known for its gigantic megalithic stone structures. Here are some things this region in southern Siberia has in common with what we have been seeing in Appalachia. Gornaya Sharia is in a region that is rich in ores like the abundant iron ore we saw in State College, Pennsylvania and is in the Kuznets Basin, one of the largest coal mining areas in Russia with one of the largest coal deposits in the world like the Pocahontas coal field the richest deposit of bituminous coal in the world back in southern West Virginia and Western Virginia. So this brings me to look at the Kemerovo Oblast of which Gornaya Sharia is a part. Kemerovo is the administrative center of the Oblast and is the coal mining capital of Russia. It is located at the confluence of the Iskatemka and Tom rivers and is situated in an S-shaped bend of the Tom River. The Kuznets Railroad Bridge crosses the Tom River at Kemerovo. The Western Siberia Railway Branch of the Great Trans-Siberian Railroad passes through Kemerovo, which has two railroad stations. The Great Trans-Siberian Railway is the longest railway line in the world. At 5,772 miles, or 9,289 kilometers, it connects Moscow in European Russia to Vladivostok in the Russian Far East. We are told that the first railway projects in Siberia began after the completion of the St. Petersburg to Moscow Railway in 1851. The Siberian line was divided into seven sections and construction started in 1891 and we are told most of the line was simultaneously worked on by 62,000 workers. This was labeled as an 1895 photo of convicts working on the railroad in East Siberia near Khabarovsk. Back in Kemerovo, there are still electric streetcars in use today in the Kemerovo tram system. There are numerous amusement parks with rides in downtown Kemerovo, like Wonderland and Antoshka. There is even what we think of as classical Roman architecture here in Siberia, like the Kemerovo Regional Lunacharsky Drama Theater. You know, Siberia! And wherever this picture was taken in the Siberian winter has an operational incline railway. And yes, giants too. This is that part of the world known previously as Grand Tartaria or Tartary. The Tartarian Empire in Asia was part of the worldwide ancient advanced Moorish civilization with its roots in ancient Mu. So now I'm going to head back to where I left off in Pennsylvania and pick up US 19 in Pittsburgh. The routes I looked at leaving southward out of Erie, US 19, US 18, and US 8 meet on the highway system around Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh looks like another one of those central hubs we saw earlier with the U.S. highway system and historic railroad lines. Pittsburgh is the largest city in Appalachia and the Ohio Valley. It developed as the vital link between the Atlantic coast and the Midwest with examples like the Allegheny Portage Railroad connecting the Pennsylvania Main Canal to Pittsburgh and the Ohio River and points west of the Allegheny Mountains. Now I'm going to leave Pittsburgh and head south on US-19 back to where it meets US-219 in Bluefield, Virginia. 
It is important to note this location at the two blue fields and the Pocahontas coal field is on the alignment of the serpent lay identified by Peter Shampoo and the red line in this Google Earth screenshot that I tracked in a previous video from the Bermuda Triangle to Lake Itasca in Minnesota, which passes through the Monadnock Pilot Mountain in North Carolina right before it passes through this location. It was from tracking the serpent lay alignment that I first encountered Burke's Garden, Virginia, which is just south of Bluefield and accessed from US-19, the next place I want to bring your attention to. Burke's Garden has a population of about 300 people in a place considered to have the most fertile soil in Virginia, but no post office, no cell phone or cable service, cool to cold weather, and one paved road to Tazewell, the nearest town about 15 miles or 23 kilometers away. Burke's Garden is known as Vanderbilt's first choice for the Grand Biltmore Estate. We are told that the landowners there wouldn't sell to George Washington Vanderbilt II, so he went to Asheville in North Carolina and said, Why here? Burke's Garden is also called God's Thumbprint and is the highest valley in Virginia and largest rural district. So a couple of things I want to mention about Burke's Garden and Tazewell County, which US-19 passes through. The Norfolk and Western Railroad's Clinch Valley line between the Coalfields of Bluefield and Norton ran through Tazewell County beside US-19 for a little ways and then went their separate ways at the southwestern end of the county near Richlands, though there were numerous other Norfolk and Western coal lines throughout this region. The coal fields of the Clinch River Valley south of Richlands were a significant source of high quality coal during the heyday of coal mining operations here. Arrows point to the main line of the Clinch Valley line following the S-shaped bends of the Clinch River. The Norfolk and Southern Railroad continues to carry freight on the Clinch Valley line. On the other side of the high land feature upon which Burke's Garden sits on top of is the North Fork of the Holston River. On one end of the North Fork of the Holston River, just above Burke's Garden, there is an abandoned railroad for the New River, Holston, and Western Railroad between Narrows and Sutter, Virginia. It was said to have been constructed starting in 1903 to supply a tannery in Narrows with virgin stands of timber. By the 1930s, the timber along the line started to be exhausted and the railroad line was dismantled in 1946. Portions of the former New River, Holston and Western Railroad became part of Virginia Route 61. The Holston River is the main river flowing from the northeast to the southwest in this region to which these other rivers are connected. Today there is still a railroad in operation called the Knoxville and Holston River Railroad. The Knoxville and Holston Railroad is a short line railroad to Tennessee that runs between Knoxville and Marbledale, 20 miles away on the French Broad River. Knoxville is situated at the confluence of three S-shaped rivers, the Holston, French Broad, and Tennessee Rivers. This configuration in Knoxville on the top left looks just like what we have seen previously at Tionesta in Pennsylvania where Tionesta Creek meets the Allegheny River, Fairmont in West Virginia, where the Monongahela River meets the West Fork River and the Tigert Creek River, and Pittsburgh, where the Allegheny River and Monongahela meet to form the Ohio River. One more thing before I head south on US-19. Tazewell, Virginia prides itself on at one time being the smallest town in America with an electric streetcar. It ran from the railroad depot to Main Street, there was a horse-drawn streetcar in town from 1892 until the introduction of the electric streetcar in 1904, which operated until 1933. The next place I'm going to look at on US-19 is Abingdon. Abingdon in Virginia is located near Virginia's borders with Tennessee and North Carolina. Like we saw in Tazewell, Abingdon was an active line on the Norfolk and Western coal lines, and the Norfolk and Southern still runs freight through the remaining track in Abingdon. Abingdon is better known for as the beginning or the end of the Virginia Creeper Trail. It operated as a branch of the Norfolk and Western Railroad until 1974, and track removal began in 1977. Today's Virginia Creeper Trail was completed in 1984. It is a 34 mile or 55 kilometer long rail trail from Abingdon to the White Top Station at the Virginia North Carolina border. Well, wasn't that nice of them? to take out all those railroad tracks when they no longer needed them for mining and have them replaced with super fun multi-use recreational trails. You think they did it because they were being really nice? I sure don't. The last place I want to mention on US-19 is Asheville in North Carolina. 
US-19 is co-signed with other highways and routes along its length, including Asheville. It is interesting to note that two or more highways running together are called concurrencies. The word currency is used not only in this application, but as a word denoting money and money exchange, as well as a word with applications in electricity, where it is defined as a stream of charged particles, such as electrons or ions, moving through an electrical conductor or space. Asheville is also located on the French Broad River, and as a matter of fact, Asheville is only 81 miles or 130 kilometers southeast of Knoxville. Asheville is at the confluence of the French Broad and Swannanoa Rivers. George Washington Vanderbilt II built more estate in Asheville, his second choice, and can also be accessed via US-19, is divided by the French Broad River, and its confluence with the Swannanoa River is on the Biltmore Estate. The Western North Carolina Railroad was said to have been constructed through here starting in the 1850s, and today the existing track is operated by different railroads to transport freight, primarily Blue Ridge Southern, Norfolk Southern, and CSX. This whole region we have been looking at through here was part of the traditional lands of the Cherokee people. They were said to have ceded their land here around Asheville in 1819. The Cherokee were one of the five civilized tribes to be forcibly removed from their land after the Indian Removal Act of 1830 was passed by Congress, and the Cherokee were marched west to Indian Territory in one of several Trails of Tears. The Swannanoa Gap Tunnel near Asheville was said to be the longest hand-dug tunnel in the world. It is 1,832 feet or 558 meters long and 123 feet or 7 meters underground. Just like what we saw with the convict labor building the Trans-Siberian Railroad, it was said to have been dug out by convict laborers digging it out with the help of nitroglycerin, working from opposite ends of the mountain, and miracle of miracles, these two tunnels lined up perfectly when they met. It is estimated that 300 convicts died as a result of cave-ins caused by the use of nitroglycerin explosives. Completed in March of 1879, we are told it opened up Asheville as a railway hub for North Carolina's western counties. Next, I'm going to share original findings by Aaron about the grid system that he uncovered when he was prompted to look into the relationship between the locations of Kirkbride buildings, key Masonic lodges, state capitals, sacred sites, and other infrastructure as well. Before I go into sharing the screenshots of what he found, let me first talk about Thomas Story Kirkbride, the Kirkbride plan, and what that entailed. Thomas Story Kirkbride was a Pennsylvanian whose great-great-grandfather, Joseph Kirkbride, was one of the original land-grant settlers of Pennsylvania, and Thomas lived there throughout his life. We are told the Pennsylvania Hospital for the Insane was built to replace the Pennsylvania Hospital's crowded insane wards at 8th and Spruce Streets, which was founded in 1751 and considered the first hospital in America. The original Pennsylvania Hospital building is still in use as such today. In Philadelphia in 1844, Kirkbride helped found the Association of Medical Superintendents of American Institutions for the Insane and held various leadership positions for it from 1844 to 1870. The Kirkbride plan was said to be a system of mental asylums he designed in the mid-19th century. The first building said to have been constructed with Kirkbride's design was the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum in Trenton, New Jersey in 1848, which was also known as the Trenton State Hospital. Dr. Henry Cotton was the medical director of the Trenton State Hospital between 1907 and 1930. He left a legacy there of the removal of teeth and body parts, allegedly as a means of preventing infection, that continued on for years after he left the facility. While the original Trenton State Hospital building is largely abandoned and considered to be haunted, like the abandoned Crescent Sanatorium we saw back in Pennsylvania, there is still a wing of it operating as the Trenton Psychiatric Hospital today. In 1854, Kirkbride first published what was considered the source book in the 19th century for psychiatric directives entitled On the Construction, Organization, and General Organization of Hospitals for the Insane, with some remarks on insanity and its treatment. We are told that throughout the 19th century, numerous psychiatric hospitals were designed and constructed according to the Kirkbride plan across the United States, and while numerous Kirkbride structures still exist, 
Many have been demolished, partially demolished, or repurposed. As I mentioned, Aaron has been making original findings about the Earth's grid system in relationship to Kirkbride facilities. He uncovered what I am going to share next when he was prompted to look into the relationship between the locations on Google Earth of Kirkbride buildings marked by white, key Masonic lodges, green, and state capitals, red. You will see in the following screenshots of what he found that there is a high correlation of these buildings being on or near these alignments. Gettysburg turned out to be a hub, circled in red, with many alignments between all three of these types of locations going out in all directions. He found the same thing happening with the New River Gorge in West Virginia as a hub, with many alignments between all three of these types of locations going out in all directions. He also looked up these three types of location alignments from the address of the Biltmore Masonic Lodge, which is marked in orange and circled in red, and found some interesting linear patterns emerging from North America. Here is a more localized view of alignments of Kirkbrides, Masonic Lodges, and State Capitals to the northeast of the Biltmore Lodge, and upon which the earlier Kirkbride example I gave of the Trenton State Hospital falls directly, circled at the top of the screenshot. The Vanderbilts were known Freemasons, and Aaron sent me the link to the Biltmore Lodge saying that George W. Vanderbilt II procured the Lodge Hall for the Biltmore Masons to conduct business. Aaron also found a lot of alignments with these three types of locations emanating from Boise, Idaho, out in the western United States, and from Gornaya Sharia, where he found many alignments, including an alignment to Palenque in Chiapas in southern Mexico. The alignment from Gornaya Sharia in Siberia on its way to Palenque in Mexico passes through such places as the Independent State Hospital in Independence, Iowa, the Mount Pleasant State Hospital in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, and the Arkansas State Hospital in Little Rock, Arkansas, all three of which were established as Kirkbride facilities in the years between 1861 and 1883, as well as Poverty Point in Epps, Louisiana. The original name of Poverty Point was Awameka, and it was an ancient sacred site of the Washita Moors. What became known to us as Poverty Point, so named we are told because the farming was terrible here, was located 38 miles or 61 kilometers northeast of Monroe, Louisiana, the imperial seat of the ancient Washita Empire, and this part of Louisiana is called Washita proper. This is the Washita flag. The Washita Moors are also known as the Ancient Ones and the Mound Builders. The Ancient Ones don't just refer to a people that existed a long time ago. It refers to an ancient people that are living in the present day. The United Nations recognized the Washita Moors as the oldest indigenous civilization on earth in 1993. Aaron found the same relationships when he was prompted to look into the relationship between the Great Serpent Mound in Peebles in Adams County, Ohio, another location of historic giant skeletons, and the locations on Google Earth of Kirkbride facilities in white, key Masonic lodges, green, and state capitals, red. There are astronomical alignments in the S-shapes of the Great Serpent Mound. As well as the Serpent Mound being in close proximity to the S-shaped bends of Brush Creek and its nearby confluences with other watercourses, as seen in this illustration circa 1883, compared with the Google Earth screenshot of the location on the right. I mentioned to Aaron that I was having difficulty finding information on historic railroads in this area next to the Great Serpent Mound, so he sent me a link he found when he looked as well of a 1914 railroad map of Ohio from the Ohio Public Utilities Commission showing all the railroads in Ohio. It is hard to see in this form, but if you click on the quadrants of the map, it shows a close-up of each. Here is a close-up of the railroads in the southwestern part of Ohio, where Peebles, Ohio, and Adams and Scioto County are located near the state's border with Kentucky, which is formed by the S-shaped bends of the Ohio River. The Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad is marked in yellow on the map, where it parallels the Ohio River. Peebles is circled in red on the rail line passing through, and there is a red box around Brush Creek showing an historic railroad line there. It is interesting to note that in the lower right quadrant of the 1914 Ohio Railroad map, that insane asylums and other state institutions were actually highlighted on it. It certainly seems like the institutionalization of people for one reason or another was quite common during this time period in our history. 
Viewer J.F. directed the attention of Aaron and myself into looking into the work of Victor Schauberger on the hydrodynamics of S-shapes. Victor Schauberger was an Austrian scientist and a pioneer in the field of water and energy research in the early 20th century, specializing in the flow of water and natural energies. Between 1928 and 1935, he worked on developing a device for the production of living water, water with an enhanced structure and necessary minerals. Schauberger described the twisting and turning of water courses as space curve, similar to the entire solar system as it follows its path through the galaxy, and that the motions of this water flow energizes water. Conversely, he believed that modern industries destroy healthy water, including the processes of municipal water treatment plants, which decompose healthy water. Aaron studied the serpent mound in relationship to these concepts and found that the serpent mound is representative of this in one way or another and shared the following information. From the vortices and the tail to the egg shape at the mouth, it represents living water flow. And Aaron also said that from his research, the serpent mound also relates to the bindu. Researching further, he found that bindu visarga belongs to the highest plane of truth and that the awakening of Bindu provides you with the ultimate truth of nature and the universe. He also mentioned that the Hindu symbol Om also has Bindu in it at the uppermost part. It is a small spot above the crescent moon, and that all the chakras are represented within the Om symbol. Bindu is kept above all of it because it is transcendental and beyond the limit of nature. One more thing before I move on from the subject of S-shaped water courses that I have found in my own research is that the historic gold rushes of the 19th century started at rivers and creeks. Kinda seems like the prospectors knew exactly where to look. Thinking out loud here, gold and water are among the best conductors of electricity. Wouldn't it stand to reason that S-shaped water courses were lined with gold for this reason? Aaron also shared images with me from Gary Schoenung's work on ruins of old earth showing these same patterns we have been seeing with regularity in this video with a central hub and multiple lines that emanate out in every direction from the hub whether it be for as we have seen rails or roads or Kirkbrides and Masonic lodges and state capitals. I noticed the same kind of starburst pattern found by Gary Shonen on the top left appearing around Knoxville Tennessee on the bottom right when I was looking at it earlier. Aaron also recently sent me a link to a 2019 online article posted on the CNN website about what was described as the finding of the root system of the world's oldest forest of fossilized trees in an abandoned quarry in Upper New York State near Cairo, New York. The Finger Lakes region of New York State that I mentioned previously in this video is in between Buffalo to the west of it and Cairo to the east. The team investigating the site after its discovery hypothesized that the forest was killed in a catastrophic flood. The forest itself was dated back to 385 million years ago. The 300 million year plus dating of the age of the fossilized forest brings to mind the dating of the rock formations that look like rock cities that we saw in Pennsylvania at the beginning of this video, like panther rocks and builder's rocks, which were dated back to the Pennsylvania age of the Carboniferous period of the Paleozoic era more than 300 million years ago and said to have been formed by sediments deposited in streams and rivers. It is almost as if 300 million years ago is their go-to place when they want to date something. At this point in my research for this video and research from before, I think it is highly likely that ancient giant trees and the root system emanating from them were an integral part of the Earth's energy grid and ley line system. The original rail lines and canals would have been providing power for the free energy system and the original architecture and infrastructure would have provided the Antiquitech to process and utilize the free energy throughout the worldwide system. The Earth's original free energy grid system was based on exact and precise geometric alignments of cities and places, which is actually what we are seeing in high definition with Aaron's Kirkbride alignments. The controllers have worked very hard not only to remove gigantic trees from our awareness, but they have also removed the Earth's grid system from our collective awareness. Nowadays, the giant tree routes are highway routes and recreational trails which has more to do with human energy being harvested from their use instead of infrastructure creating free energy for the system to use for the benefit of all life everywhere. Railways have been replaced mostly with asphalt roadways, the primary use of bitumen production, 
in which this petroleum-based product is used to bind aggregate particles like gravel and ultimately requires a lot of road maintenance. We drive vehicles with tires made primarily from rubber. Rubber is an insulator that limits the transfer of electricity and the disposal of worn tires ultimately creates an environmental problem. The harvesting of rubber also made a fortune for the owners of plantations of rubber trees, past and present, who use overworked and underpaid workers. This is an historic photograph of an electric streetcar in a Charlotte, North Carolina neighborhood. Electric streetcar systems at one time were in existence everywhere and not just limited to a few places here and there, like what we see today in some of the larger cities around the world. But mostly, the removal of the electric streetcar lines all over the world left us with the chaotic traffic patterns of today, like what we see in Hanoi and Vietnam in our day and age, which at one time in its history had a state-of-the-art electric streetcar system. As I mentioned earlier in this video, it certainly appears like the petroleum industry was developed in the 1850s in order to provide an energy technology to replace the free energy transportation system of the original civilization and to make insane amounts of money from the harvesting of non-renewable resources and the imposition of a wage slavery work system throughout the world. Let's look at the example of a typical company town in Appalachia to illustrate this. The people of these towns were pretty much dependent on the company for everything. They'd have a job for life working for the company, but they weren't paid much, and the company got it all back from them anyway because they owned everything. Appalachia historically, and even today, is one of the poorest regions in the United States, and it is believed that the cycles of poverty came as a direct result of the company town structure. Railroad, coal, lumber, and banking barons early on controlled the capitalistic economic system that came into form in largely rural Appalachia. They offered pay, boarding, and subsistence farming in return for a 16-hour workday. In many places, their pay came in the form of scrip instead of dollars that could only be used in the company's stores. Pretty much the definition of wage slavery. Then to add insult to injury, the companies outsourced their menial low-paying job model in other countries, leaving American company towns high and dry. And what about coal? Is there more to that story as well? Coal is mostly carbon, with varying amounts of other elements, primarily hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and nitrogen. Carbon is the chemical backbone of life on Earth. All organic life is comprised of carbon. Carbon is a non-metal that has the atomic number of six. It has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons, and can bond with other carbon atoms to an almost unlimited degree. Four allotropes, or physical forms of carbon, are graphite, diamond, fullerene, and graphene. Silicon is the closest analog of carbon. Silicon is a hard, brittle, crystalline solid. It is nonmetal and a semiconductor. Semiconductors are essential components of electronic devices. I think there's something going on here between carbon and silicon that is being kept from our awareness, but I don't know enough about this subject to say anything conclusively. I will speculate that receiving a lump of coal at Christmas for being naughty may be misrepresenting the importance of coal and what it stands for. Chad Williams and I talked at length about his thoughts that tree roots could be highway routes in our recent conversation, Giant Trees, the Earth's Grid, and the New World Order. In this conversation, among many other things, Chad and I talked about ideas like giant trees were integrally connected to the Earth's original grid system, and that tree energy equaled free energy, and that those behind the reset of history and the New World Order that they were ushering in sought to capitalize on the power of the giant trees and the Earth's energy grid, but in a negative way that sought to only benefit them. What I have found as a result of my ongoing research for On the Trail of Giants in Appalachia and beyond provides a substantial amount of supporting evidence for the ideas we discussed. This is what I have come to believe has taken place here. In the course of all the past and present research I have done for my videos in five and a half years of extensive research. Like I said earlier in this video, I believe there was a deliberately caused cataclysm that sent directed energy through the Earth's grid system that devastated the surface of the Earth and destroyed the original ancient advanced Moorish civilization that built all of this infrastructure. In short, I believe the beings behind the cataclysm were shovel-ready to dig enough of the original infrastructure out of the ruined earth so they could be used and civilization restarted, 
which I think started in earnest in the mid to late 1700s and early 1800s. They only used the pre-existing infrastructure until they found replacement fuel sources that could be monetized and controlled by them, and when what remained of the original infrastructure was no longer useful to them or inconvenient to their agenda, they had it destroyed, discontinued, or abandoned, typically in a very short time after it was said to have been constructed. I believe that the Earth's original free energy grid system, which was originally designed to benefit all life everywhere, was reverse engineered into a control system used against humanity by those responsible for what has taken place here, for the benefit of a very few. Oh yes, and they claimed the very best of everything for themselves, including, but not limited to, what became the luxurious Greenbrier Resort. While the new elite class lived in the lap of luxury and helped themselves to the best of everything, they had little care for anyone or anything else. Not at all. Quite the opposite. They have actively facilitated the demise of all the rest of us, who they call useless eaters, into the present day. Those that heretofore have been in control of the world in which we live deviously figured out a way to keep us asleep by this new culture they created, and they have been getting filthy rich at our expense because we have been paying for our own poisoning with our addictions, paying for our own mind control programming with distractions, and keeping us in consumerism mode to enrich corporate interests and ultimately financing our own destruction. So again, I think there was a hostile takeover of the Earth and its grid system, which was reverse engineered as a mind control and energy harvesting system for human energy. A sudden cataclysmic event, creating swamps, deserts, and even submerging entire land masses around the Earth, would account for how a highly advanced worldwide civilization of giants could be wiped from the face of the Earth and erased from our collective memory. In the business world, there are two kinds of takeover bids, and I think this is a really important concept to understand with regards to what has taken place here. The first is called a friendly takeover bid, and occurs when the board of directors from both companies, target and acquirer, negotiate and approve the bid. Then there is the hostile takeover bid, which occurs when an acquiring company seeks to acquire another company, the target company, but the board of directors from the target company has no desire to be acquired by or merged with another company. The two most common strategies used by acquirers in a hostile takeover are a tender offer or a proxy vote. The tender offer is an offer to purchase shares at a premium to the market price. The proxy offer is persuading shareholders of the target company to vote out the existing management. The negative beings behind what has taken place here wanted to set up a new god as lord of this world, Lucifer, and wanted a proxy vote for their hostile takeover. They wanted to persuade enough of humanity to voluntarily accept Lucifer over the creator of the universe. The only way they can accomplish this acceptance, however, is by outright lies, deception, and duplicity. Because if people knew the true agenda of these controllers, the majority of humanity would never ever accept this. But the problem is, in a free will zone like Earth, the human beings who live here have to give their consent to choose whether to follow the light or the dark. I bring all of this up because it is important to know this is what's been going on here. Humans are inherently sovereign beings. They have gone to all of this trouble because by universal law they cannot lay a finger on us. They have tricked us into accepting their sovereignty over our own. The controllers have always feared the great awakening of humanity and thus threw everything they could at us to prevent it from happening and keep us asleep so we would never know what hit us. But no matter what they do, they can't keep it from happening. Among many other things, they lost control of the narrative no matter how hard they try to get it back. As previously mentioned, I will be talking about my findings regarding a relatively recent cataclysmic event in depth in the fourth and final themed segment of this series.